Okay, sergeants, if we can begin our recordings, uh, PC recording is underway. According to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. All right, Mr. Sadowski. Yep. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Finance. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Thank you and good morning. For all attending today's final hearing on the fiscal 22 preliminary budget. I'm council member Daniel Drum and I'm the chair of the council's committee on finance. Today we will hear from the department of finance and then we will be joined by the subcommittee on capital budget chaired by council member Rosenthal. And we'll hear from the department of design and construction and the public. I'm going to start by acknowledging my colleagues joining us. They are Majority Leader Matteo, Council Member Adams, Council Member Gibson, Council Member Lewis, Council Member Ayala, Council Member Grudenchik, Council Member Amphrey Samuel. I'm sure that others will be joining us later on over the course of today's hearings. This time last year, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Committee on Finance was forced to cancel its preliminary budget hearing with the Department of Finance and the Department of Design and Construction. It's hard to express how much has changed since last year and how much the COVID-19 pandemic has upended our lives, routines, and finances. I do believe that our ability to hold this hearing today is a testament to our collective perseverance in the wake of this crisis, but let it also serve as a reminder of the work that remains to be done. As we look ahead to fiscal 2022, the road to recovery remains a long one. So we must use every tool at our disposal to alleviate the continued hardships experienced by New Yorkers. We will first hear from the Department of Finance. The Department of Finance is tasked with the collection and management of city revenues, as well as assessing the value of property in the city. Today, the committee will examine the department's $321 million expense budget and its collection of $934 million in miscellaneous revenue. The department's fiscal 2022 preliminary expense budget decreases by $3.3 million compared to fiscal 2021, primarily due to a decrease in contractual service spending. Despite this decrease in spending for its operations, the department forecasts that it will collect approximately $94 million more in miscellaneous revenue in fiscal 22 than it did in fiscal 2021, almost exclusively from increased collections on parking violation fines. In addition to reviewing the Department of Finance's proposed fiscal 2022 budget, the committee will review the department's performance in providing services over the course of fiscal 2021 which is measured in the, in, the preliminary, uh, in the preliminary mayor's management uh, report. Throughout the hearing, specific attention will be paid to outreach related to DOF assistance programs, the office of the sheriff and budgetary new needs and headcount for the department. We will now hear testimony from the commissioner of the Department of Finance, Sharif Solomon, who was joined by DOF's first deputy commissioner, Michael Heinemann, and, Shari and Sheriff uh, Fusito. Welcome commissioner uh, to your first hearing before this committee in your new role. I look forward to working with you for the rest of the term uh, and uh, we look uh, working with you closely on many issues. But before we hear from you, I will turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items and to swear in the witnesses. Uh, committee council. Thank you. My name is Noah Brick and I am counsel to the New York City Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you should unmute yourself, 
after you have been, if you should mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you will need to then be unmuted again by the host. I will now administer the affirmation and you will be called on to so affirm at the end. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Commissioner uh, Solomon? I do. First Deputy Commissioner Hyman? Do we have a sound issue? I do. Thank you. And uh, Sheriff Facito. Uh, so Sheriff Facito had a personal emergency this morning okay. and he's not able to join us. Okay, uh, thank you. Commissioner Solomon, you may begin when ready. Sure. Thank you and good morning, Chair Drum, members of the Finance Committee and all members here with us today. My name is Sharif Solomon. I am the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Finance. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the preliminary budget for fiscal year 2022. I am joined by Michael Hyman, first deputy commissioner of the department. Let me start by expressing my appreciation for your partnership in advancing priority initiatives, such as revamping the city's tax lien uh, uh, authority and enhancing the property tax and interest deferral payment program. Together, we have made the lien process fairer and offered additional opportunities for relief for taxpayers facing hardship. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge Speaker Johnson and the team at Council Finance with whom we continue to work on the jointly appointed New York City Advisory Commission on Property Tax Reform. I look forward to working closely with you in my new capacity, as well as with members of the committee I haven't met yet in the weeks and months ahead. By now you've heard testimony from several agencies that detail the tumultuous year we've all experienced with a once in a century pandemic that has wreaked havoc on all facets of our society. Yet as we look back over the past year and the many ways that COVID disrupted the traditional norms of government operations, we must also take stock of the heroics of the city workforce. Hundreds of DOF employees remained at their posts from the beginning of the pandemic, providing continuity of service to New Yorkers in their hours of need. Our business center teams have continued to report to work throughout the pandemic, serving the public with compassion and with professionalism. Our facilities team has been working almost nonstop for the past year to make our offices and business centers safe for both customers and staff. And as the public has come to know well, our sheriff's office has played an outsized role in the city's pandemic response, with deputies going above and beyond the call of duty, often at great personal risk to keep our city safe. They have taken on many new responsibilities and have done an outstanding job. Department of Finance staff have stepped up in the face of unprecedented challenges, and I wanted to take this opportunity to commend them publicly. Looking forward, as the agency responsible for collecting the revenue on which city services depend, the Department of Finance will play an important role in New York City's recovery. While we acknowledge that we face a tough road ahead, we are optimistic for a full recovery for the benefit of all New Yorkers. Our optimism is rooted in a number of positive signs that portend improvements in the city's fiscal position, our economy, and our public health. First and foremost, we are deeply grateful for the proceeds from the Biden administration's American Rescue Plan, which will provide the proverbial shot in the arm our government needs to deliver for New Yorkers. Second, some of the tax revenues on which we depend have remained relatively stable, notably among them the city's personal income and business taxes. Third, the city has recovered nearly one third of the jobs lost since the height of the pandemic and is expected to regain more as COVID restrictions are lifted. And finally, the massive vaccination effort underway is reaching more people, instilling confidence among the public on the vaccine's efficacy and providing the public foundation upon which our recovery will be built. While we are encouraged about what these developments may mean for recovery, challenges remain from this unprecedented public health and fiscal crisis. The city's real estate market still faces headwinds, 
with residential sales and rental prices showing weakness in some areas. And there remains uncertainty on the demand for commercial office space. Sales tax, hotel tax, and property transfer tax revenues remain down sharply. And the severe hit the tourism industry has taken will take some time to heal. To aid small businesses in their recovery, Mayor de Blasio proposed the New York City Small Business Recovery Tax Credit, a $50 million rental assistance program for up to 17,000 small businesses with gross revenue below $1 million in the arts, entertainment, recreation, food services, and accommodation sectors. The tax credit is equal to 6% of calendar year 2021 rent, up to a maximum of $10,000. We look forward to the proposal becoming law. Turning now to property taxes and the decline in market values in the tentative role for fiscal year 2022 that was released on January 15th, 2021. As you know, we are required to value properties based on their status and condition as of January 5th of each year, the date referred to as the taxable status date. Our valuation methods rely on inputs like sales data, income and expense data, and construction activity. But the timing and unique nature of the market disruption created by the pandemic presented major challenges in the valuation process. Historically, historically <clears throat> historical trends became unusable and 2019 income and expense data did not reflect current market conditions. To account for the pandemic's impact, it was necessary for our valuation team to factor in macroeconomic data from 2020, such as the, uh, the um, unemployment rate, wage information, and industry data on office vacancy and absorption rates, and then develop the trend factor that would be used in the valuation process. As a result, the tentative assessment role for fiscal 22 shows the total market value of New York City properties at about $1.3 trillion, a decrease of 5.2% from the previous year. Correspondingly, citywide assessed values fell by 3.9% to $260 billion. The declines were primarily driven by market value decreases in class four as hotels, retailers, and office buildings experienced the effects of the sharp decline in tourism and acceleration of pre-COVID trends towards e-commerce and the dramatic increase in telework leading to empty office buildings, among other things. By contrast, one to three family homes in class one saw a flat market value increase of 0.8%. Single family homes saw a 2.9% increase, which is potentially indicative of increased market demand due to consumer preferences for properties in less densely populated areas of the city. Although overall class one market values remain flat, assessed values increased by 5.2% due to a state law provision that caps assessed value growth. The caps are well known for protecting homeowners when market values increase, but when market value growth is low or negative, a catch-up effect causes assessed values to increase. To address this, Mayor de Blasio has proposed a $300 rebate for New Yorkers who own and live in properties with a market value of less than $500,000. This rebate would essentially cover the tax increase that these homeowners would otherwise experience this year. We look forward to working with you and our state partners to enact the rebate. While the administration has proposed this rebate to help property owners affected by the pandemic, we know that significant reforms to the property tax system are needed. The Advisory Commission on Property Tax Reform issued the most significant reform recommendations of the past 40 years, and we look forward to the Commission's final report to be issued later this year. The Department of Finance will be fully involved in this process, and we look forward to working with you and hearing from the public as we press on with long due reform. We equally look forward to participating alongside you in a separate effort to explore further improvements to the tax lien program. Again, we thank you for your partnership in the recent enactment of the fairer tax lien process and trust that the task force authorized by this new law will propose recommendations outlining ways to continue to improve the process. As our agency participates in the, these important reform efforts, we remain laser focused on the ongoing work of ensuring 
quality service delivery to all New Yorkers. To that end, a number of new programs and services were instituted over the past year to make it easier and safer for members of the public to conduct their business with the Department of Finance. We have launched the New York City Tenant Access Portal for rent freeze program participants, making it possible for participants to access and update important information. In addition, New Yorkers can now apply for rent freeze benefits online via the portal, and those enrolled in the program will soon be able to renew their benefits online. We have introduced PayPal and Venmo as options for paying parking tickets and plan for them to, be, to make them available for other types of transactions in the near future. We introduced a pay by phone option for property taxes to give customers another payment option during the pandemic. In less than six months, we processed more than $5 million in property tax payments by phone. We rolled out one quarter earlier than expected the property tax payment receipt that you and your colleagues have passed. We debuted an appointment scheduling feature allowing customers who cannot complete their transactions online to visit our business centers safely in accordance with social distancing guidelines. And we improved our business tax e-services website to make it easier for our businesses to navigate the business tax filing, refund, and payment processes. We are also developing a number of new user-friendly features, including a series of property tax benefit outreach videos, a new chatbot tool that will be rolled out initially for parking, and an additional story map presentation for income and expense information for income producing properties at the neighborhood level. And finally, we retooled our oper operations in some areas to adapt to priority needs. We continue to vigorously pursue deed fraud, a crime that victimizes too many vulnerable New Yorkers each year. Our land records division has introduced optical character recognition, a powerful tool for identifying potential cases of deed fraud through better indexing, enhanced searches, and improved data extraction and discovery. We are, working, we are also working with the state legislature on passing stronger deed fraud legislation, which would increase the penalties associated with forgery, the filing of false instruments, and fraudulent notarization practices. In closing, I am extremely proud of the efforts made by the Department of Finance to serve the public during the pandemic. We know that many challenges and opportunities lie before us. We are ready to meet them. I look forward to the Council's continued partnership as we join with all city agencies in contributing to New York's recovery. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to the day, hopefully soon, that we can be together in person. I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Commissioner, and welcome again to uh, your first hearing as Commissioner. Uh, before we begin with questioning, let me just say that we have also been joined by uh, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, Council Member Powers, Council Member Moya, Council Member Koslowitz, Council Member Diaz, Council Member Rosenthal, Council Member Levin, and I believe that's Council Member Dharma Diaz, uh, who is here with us. Okay. Um, let me start by asking a few questions regarding some of the new budget needs. The fiscal 22 preliminary plan contains new needs totaling uh, $4.2 million in fiscal 2021 and 500,000 in fiscal 2022. This includes 2.8 million for post-production support of the business tax system, $963,000 for post-production support of the property tax system. Could you uh, provide us with an explanation of what post-production post support for these two uh, interfaces entails? Sure, sure, absolutely, Chair. So first, our business tax system um, and property tax system, important systems that are responsible basically for the generation of $40 billion in revenue. So significant um, systems that we need to make sure are um, uh, uh, you know, maintained and um, kept um, humming along. Um, the new needs that we have um, refer to two things, software maintenance, which is needed for the systems, which basically make sure that they're operating on the latest platforms 
um, and also make sure that they have the security features needed, of course, which is critical in this, uh, you know, in this environment. The second piece is operational support. And that you know, essentially means that any changes that we have to make to the systems. So for example, when you look at changes that are made you know, through legislation, if it's the property tax receipt, for example, if we're talking about the property tax rebate that the mayor has proposed, um, or if we're talking about in the case of BTS, small, uh, the small business recovery tax credit, uh, those require changes to the system. And those, uh, that, that operational support is the other component of the new needs for those two systems. So what is the total funding uh, amount an associated headcount for the business tax system and the property tax system? Sure, for the business tax system, it's about nine headcount at a cost of $6.9 million. And for the PTS system, it is a 35 headcount and total funding of 8.2 million. Okay, thank you. Um, the department identifies $500,000 for lean sale outreach in fiscal 21 and fiscal 22. However, in the most recent modification, this money was placed in HPD's budget, not DOF for the lean sale out, uh, outreach initiative. Can you clarify that this money is no longer in the agency's budget and is actually with HPD now as they are administering, uh, the, the, as they're the administering agency uh, for this council initiative? Sure. So um, that, that is correct, Chair. And, you know, per the agreement that, um, that we had with you and your colleagues on the lean sale, reauthorization, um, there, was a, there was an outreach component in there that um, uh, specified that there would be funding specifically for outreach organizations uh, to the tune of a million dollars over the two fiscal years. So uh, it will be uh, um, uh, contracted through HPD. Um, and we've uh, been talking to HPD very closely. We are going to collaborate with them and share uh, certainly the outreach efforts that the department has undertaken in-house and we'll make sure that um, whatever outreach activities are there are closely coordinated. I think in talking to HPD so far, we know that their scope of work is going to include a number of things, aggressively promoting outreach events, uh, promoting PT aid, of course, which is a program that we're all proud of that allows people who are facing hardships to uh, de uh, defer property tax payments basically also to establish the metrics on how many people have been reached, um, how many people have entered payment plans, et cetera. So we're excited to work with the department, to work with HPD, and also with the outreach organizations that will uh, actually uh, be tasked with administering this outreach. So thank you for reminding me also, I wanna just um, again, congratulate uh, Councilmember Adrian Adams mm -hmm. for the fantastic work that you did on the lean sale issue. So thank you to Councilmember Adrian Adams and you mentioned how you're going to work. How specifically will that work between the two agencies? Well, I think that we will, we don't have any formal agreement that we will have between the agencies, but HPD recognizes that DOF has experience in doing the outreach that we have done during the past lean sales. So we will just be, you know, essentially coordinating on making sure that that scope of work that the advocacy organizations will uh, prosecute, that those essentially will be um, supplemented by DOF outreach staff that we have out there now that participate also with you and your colleagues at outreach events that you host or in other virtual settings where we work with community-based organizations and other groups to make sure we're getting the word out. Um, so. so what's your current outreach uh, staffing level right now? Sure, so I think in tax, for the tax lien process, we have a number of different units that help out in different ways, right? So you have in our external affairs unit, we have, um, uh, you know, uh, the headcount is three individuals that we have there that are dedicated to it, but we also have outreach staff in the exemptions unit because a major part, as you know, of, um, of providing relief uh, to homeowners is to be able to sign them up for exemption programs, right? senior citizen homeowner exemption, disabled homeowner exemption or others, or in payment plans. And so you have um, staff from the exemptions unit of about eight people um, who are helping on this. And you also have staff from, uh, from, from the collections unit that really works to process those, those payment plans. Um, so basically all in, we're looking at 16 active employees that are participating in some form or fashion 
in the tax lien outreach process. Okay, thank you. And how much does the department spend each time uh, it administers a lien sale? So um, it's, 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 a, it's multiple components. Um, it, the, 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 the total cost is roughly around 2.3 million and that includes the PS and OTPS um, services. So, you know, it'll include things like printing services for all the letters that are mailed. It'll include um, an advertising budget, uh, but it also includes the actual cost of, you know, the, uh, the personal service cost for the 16 people that I had mentioned. And then also the, um, uh, the processing uh, staff in our, um, in our collections unit. It also uh, includes that. So it's a total of 2.3 million all in for all those costs. Okay, and let me also ask, when do you think that you will schedule the next lien sale? So as you know, <clears throat> there is a, um, a gubernatorial executive order that's in effect now that prohibits localities across mm. the state from uh, moving forward with lien sales. Um, I believe it expires um, in, a, in a few days from now. So we're going to, you know, we're going to be keeping a close eye on that to see if it's extended. Um, should the executive order be lifted, we intend to proceed with a lien sale this year pursuant to, again, the revamp process that we were successful in working together on and recognizing full well that mm -hmm. there's also this significant reform effort too through this task force that will be impaneled a few days from now uh, with, uh, of course, six appointees from the council side, six appointees from the administration side that will look at how we can further reform the process moving forward next year and beyond. So, um, you know, we're keeping a close eye on the governor's mm -hmm. order and then we'll see how we move forward. We'll also move forward with all the hardship um, exemptions to make sure that people um, um, could sign up for those uh, Commissioner, plans. Commissioner, Commissioner, I was under the impression that that order was no longer in effect. Our understanding is that, it, you know, it, it, is that it still is in effect, but we will be able to just confirm that. Um, again, it was up for, you know, a few days from now. Um, but should we confirm that it's lifted, then our plan is to move forward. And that would that, do you think it would be as early as the summer or fall that you would do that? Potentially, potentially, okay. yes. All right. Um, I know that the sheriff has a personal um, issue and I wish him well. We, we really like the sheriff and we respect his work a lot. And uh, I was looking forward to asking him a few questions. Uh, he's a great guy. But maybe you can help us with some questions on that, Mr. Commissioner, as well. So due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Office of the Sheriff took on additional work to enforce public health regulations, which included enforcing state travel restrictions, as well as venue and event closures. So did the Sheriff's deputies um, <clears throat> actually uh, increase the headcount that they have or spend additional dollars? Uh, can you just give us a little bit of an update on what that looked like um, uh, during the uh, during the pandemic? Sure. So I think, as you noted, the sheriff has taken on a, a number of new responsibilities. Um, and uh, so I think that th there wasn't necessarily an increase um, in headcount to be able to do this. I think one of the key points that, um, you know, in terms of the total context and picture here, is that a lot of the sheriff's work is depending is dependent on the courts functioning, right? So we know during the pandemic, court um, operations um, were suspended in many respects. So as that work dialed down, the sheriff was able to dial up the work that related to travel checkpoints um, and um, and um, social distancing enforcement and going after sort of illegal parties and venues. So um, so just to give an example on the um, travel checkpoints, um, the total staff dedicated there was about nine total, um, eight deputy sheriffs and a supervisor. Um, and so the PS cost would be around like $400,000 and about $15,000 for uh, OTPS for fuel costs and things like that. Um, and you know the, the checkpoints, they were, uh, were able to conduct about 265 of them throughout the various crossings across the city, um, you know, the Port Authority crossings mainly, mm -hmm. and then also bus stops, et cetera. Um, they were able to um, stop over 10,000 vehicles. 
um, and they were able to, um, uh, half of those vehicles had, were registered in New York, the other half were registered out of state. They were able to get um, you know, a little over 4,000 of the New York state travel forms that were completed as well. Um, with respect to the um, venue enforcement, um, it's been highly publicized. So you see, you know, uh, certainly it's been a, a, a regular drumbeat on the weekends where the sheriff has stepped in and shut down an illegal venue. Um, and uh, the number there is about 46 of those venues uh, have been shut down in total. And I just think it's just important to note that of the 46, you know, it's important not only for the pandemic that we're in here uh, to ensure the social distancing, the, you know, the mask wearing, but a lot of what the sheriff has found is other sort of violations, fire code and building code violations and sort of these underground um, uh, settings that the sheriff had. Um, so the sheriff's presence there in action is also not only a public health um, um, remediation tool, but also to enforce these dangerous conditions as well. Well, I like, I hope they keep that drum beat going and uh, that, um, you know, we had 350 folks in a club in Jackson Heights uh, um, on the block where I live, I, I, on 78th Street and Roosevelt Avenue. So it's amazing that people would actually, you know, go out and congregate like that and, and very, if any, were wearing masks. So uh, we're appreciative of Absolutely. that. Yeah. Um, so uh, are there any other ways in which the sheriff's office has altered its operations due to the COVID-19 pandemic? I think, you know, that they're continuing to do what they do on a daily basis. They continue to serve orders of protection. They continue to do um, inmate transports when requested by the courts. Um, so they, the additional responses that they've taken on <clears throat> um, pretty much make up the, um, uh, what they, the additional work that they're focused on, but their quote unquote bread and butter work is still continuing. Uh, you know, albeit at a slower pace, but we fully expect that when the courts get going again, that that volume will increase and, and, and you know, we'll continue to keep that balance. Can, uh, can you tell me if the uh, office's headcount is subject to the freeze and um, also um, uh, what vacancies currently exist within that office? Sure. So um, the... So we were able just now to secure approval to hire 16 deputy sheriffs, um, which was um, significant. And we wanna be able to do that to shore up, to shore up their ranks. Um, the, uh, the, the deputy sheriff title series is not subject to the three for one. I'm sorry, is subject to the three for one policy. Um, but we think that with the 16 that have been um, that have been um, hired. We, we, we are, um, you know, it takes a long time to get a deputy sheriff on board, right? Because they have to go through all the training, et cetera. But we're confident that we can make a big uh, dent in the headcount. Their current headcount in the sheriff's office is um, 227 as of February. And the vacancies there? And vacancies. We have about, about 35. 35, okay. Thank you for that. Uh, let's talk a little bit now about savings programs. In the fiscal 22 preliminary plan, the department realizes approximately 1.2 million in savings as the result of its hiring and attrition management program. Um, this program reduces the department's budgeted headcount by 59 positions, which are spread across its administration, uh, 30 positions, operations, 21 positions, legal, four positions, and its parking violations bureau, four positions uh, in the program areas. Can you provide us with the titles associated with this headcount reduction? Sure, so um, we, we actually are viewing this as act an actual um, hiring delay um, as opposed to a headcount reduction. So you'll see in fiscal 22 that the headcount goes up to 2102. Um, so when we haven't undertaken the exercise essentially to identify titles that would be covered under that 
reduction because we're treating it again as a, you know as a hiring delay. I think you're you're muted, sir. Okay, uh, uh, as the um, as of the fiscal 22 preliminary plan, the Department of Finance's uh, vacancy rate stands at 8%, and it's not expected to, to decrease until fiscal 2022. So what impact has this persistent vacancy had on DOF's ability to manage its portfolio? We asked this question of even previous commissioners as well. So we're sure. trying to get it on this. Sure, I think that, you know, overall we've been able to um, meet our core mission. I do think that, you know, you have in the case of the sheriff, for example, where we talk about the additional responsibilities uh, taken on the hours of the day that those responsibilities are taken on as well. Um, so you can experience things like increased overtime um, and certain decreased uh, productivity in other areas. But I think overall, um, you know, we're meeting the agency's core mission. So can you provide us with uh, how many new hires have come on board so far in fiscal 21 and how many employees have left? Sure. So we have, um, we have, because uh, um, of the hiring freeze, uh, essentially, um, for the, for the, you know, first half of fiscal 21, for the most part, uh, we've only been able to onboard a handful um, of new employees, when I say a handful, less than five. Um, but as I mentioned, um, you know, we recently received approval from OMB uh, to hire several uh, positions. Um, I mentioned the sheriffs. We'll also be able to hire um, assessors. We've been able to hire auditors um, and certain other um, employees. So we're making progress on onboarding folks, so we can, uh, you know, so we can address the vacancies and. Uh, you know, enhance our services. Do you know how many assessors and auditors? Sure, the assessors were 16 as well. Um, the auditors were, um, the, the auditors primarily through promotions and then backfill. So we'll be able to do the, the, the level uh, twos, which is important in, in the audit work, given the complexity of those cases that um, you know, that every level one is going to graduate to level two on time. Okay, thank you again. Uh, let's talk a little bit about she and Dehi. Um, auto renewals, the council recently passed a local law at the mayor's request that implemented an auto renewal program for last year's she and D uh, recipients such that they would no longer be required to submit a renewal application to receive the benefits next year. The law also allowed DOF to require renewal application in four specific instances where DOF had information to believe that the property was no longer eligible. DOF provided the council with a list of approximately 800 properties out of the total of 55,000 beneficiaries that are believed might no longer be eligible for next year. So can you describe for us the outreach that you conducted to verify each of those 800 properties was in fact no longer eligible? And did you individually contact each property on the list? Sure, so we have, um, we have uh, um, several things that we've done to reach out to those folks. Um, and first, I do wanna thank the council for um, passing that legislation. I think that, you know, we were all gratified with the, um, state legislation uh, to do the one year renewal. And then of course, joining with the council, being able to move forward on that. But we also need to make sure that, you know, those who are entitled to the benefits are receiving them. So uh, the small number, as you mentioned of 800 out of the total were identified as possibly um, not eligible anymore. And we've sent them postcards, we've sent them letters, we've done social media postings. We've done, uh, we've also worked with, the, with with the, um, with the council finance team to also provide phone numbers to those individuals. We will be reaching out to them uh, individually. We will be calling everyone. I believe 177 have responded. Uh, um, and so we're you know sorting out whether they're eligible or not, one way or the other, we're going to resolve the issue. Uh, and we'll be reaching out to the 550 or so um, to be able to um, 
uh, you know, have have a final disposition on that. So in the course of that outreach, uh, did you find anybody who was on the list erroneously uh, who might have been eligible? It's not necessarily uh, a matter of whether or not they were erroneously on the list. I think the goal here would be that using um, different data sources, for example, if there's um, a deed recorded on a property, then maybe, you, you know, then that <clears throat> gives us an idea that there was a transfer or whether or not we regularly get feeds of data um, about individuals who may be deceased. Um, so we use that data and we use the data on deed transfers, et cetera, to see if there's potentially someone who would no longer be eligible. In the case of a property transfer, you could still have a person nevertheless who would be eligible, right? So it's just that kind of investigation. The main thing is we wanna make sure we reach out and have some action by them to proactively apply so we can sort it all out. Okay, and what resources do you allocate for uh, she and he? Sure, so th this is another um, area where like the tax lien, you have a number of different units that work on it. Um, and so we have, I mean, the outreach efforts involve a lot of things like digital and print and uh, personnel that are going out, um, doing the virtual outreach sessions. So there's a few different units that actually do it. Um, and we can, you know, pull the data to sort of prorate the time spent on this particular topic from the various other divisions to come up with um, you know, one total number. Okay, thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit now about the Stimulus Act, uh, the American Recovery Program, its restrictions on tax cuts. So the federal stimulus legislation includes $350 billion in unrestricted funds to states, territories, and localities. A provision in that funding requires the repayment of those funds if states use them to directly or indirectly reduce taxes, either through tax rate, either through rate reductions, tax cut credits or rebates. In effect, it prevents the use of stimulus funding to pay for tax cuts. The mayor recently announced several tax programs, including a small business tax credit and a property tax rebate. And you mentioned the rebate a little bit in your um, opening. I'm gonna have a couple of questions on that as well that maybe you can answer for us. So since the city would need state authorization for these programs, do you believe that the language in the stimulus package would put any of the city's stimulus funding at risk if the city implemented the mayor's proposed tax reductions, rebate, et cetera? So um, as you know, Chair, the American Rescue Plan does have specific language on, uh, on the use of these funds by states. Um, including the restriction on funds by the states to lower taxes. Um, it, it is our belief that the limitation does not exist for the use of proceeds from the American Rescue Plan for cities. Uh, the language specifically uh, um, uh, can be found in the provisions applicable to the state, but it is not found in provisions applicable to direct aid to localities. So therefore it's our position that it wouldn't be impacted the, you know, the two proposals that the mayor has proposed, the small business and the rebate would not be impacted by that provision. Okay, interesting, thank you. And uh, just on the rebate itself, small co-ops and condos are also governed by assessment caps, uh, just like one to three family homes, which uh, you note is the rationale for the rebate. So does that mean your proposed rebate would be available to these small co-op and condo properties? So I think first we, we recognize that there are small um, properties in class two, the so-called class two ABC properties um, who are also subject to growth caps. Um, when you look at the, you know, um, a key criterion of the rebate is that someone must be a primary resident. Um, when you look at that class, the primary residency is low. It's not non-existent. There are some primary residents who live in those small buildings, um, but it is relatively very small compared to the class one properties that have much higher primary residency. So the idea behind the rebate was really to help those primary residents 
um, who were facing that increase. Um, you know, but you know, obviously it's a state proposal that we need to push through in coordination with the council. We wanna be able to share with you exactly what we're proposing and then be able to have a joint effort to go to Albany to get it reacted. So it'll be part of the discussion as we move forward about you know, potential expansion. Yeah, I, I look forward to that discussion because um, I myself am a co-op owner as are many others and that's my primary residence. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's make sure that we discuss that uh, as we move forward. Uh, and then I have another set of questions and then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues so that they can ask questions as well. <clears throat> Uh, this involves interest, uh, interest rates and delinquency. Uh, currently, the delinquent property tax rates, I'm sorry, I'm a little lost. Okay, the property tax rates are charged 5% if the property assessed value is below $250,000 and 18% if it's above uh, that threshold. The recent lien sale legislation included a provision to create a third interest rate for medium valued properties whose assessed value mm -hmm. is between 250 and 450,000. And that's on the assessed value. This is a positive step that will make it easier to lower the late interest rate on those properties. However, however even with only two late interest rates, uh, property owners are often confused with what rate they are charged. Uh, the council frequently hears, myself included, from property owners complaining about the 18% rate when they are actually only being charged 5%. DOF does publish these rates on its website, but they are not listed on any tax bill or notice sent to the property owner. Moreover, DOF does not clarify if which of the definitions of assessed value is used to determine the threshold, actual, transitional, uh, billable, or taxable assessed value. So uh, how will DOF ensure that property owners have the correct information on what the consequences of late payments are? Um, they need to know up front, I think, if you don't do this, you're gonna get an 18% you know, um, uh, interest rate on what you're gonna owe. You have to pay your tax no matter what. <laughs> Something along those lines, Commissioner. That's what we're looking to. Absolutely. Begin. Yeah, and so first, you know, let me start first by again, you know, thanking the council for that second tier, if you will, of interest rates for those properties between two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in AV uh, in, in uh, assessed value and four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We think it's a, uh, uh, you know, it was a good product. I think that um, we will update our web page to make sure that it includes the information um, and includes the not only the rate structure, the new rate structure, but also it includes and clarifies that the definition of assessed value here is actual assessed value. And we'll make sure that that is very clear. Um, uh, so we will, we agree, we always can be more transparent, more, um, uh, we, can, we can put information in more places so that people understand exactly what kind of consequences they may be if property taxes are not paid on time. Uh, I think the other piece of it, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say great because that's um, something I think all of us, all of the council members get a question about at every town hall that we do, you know? Sure, so absolutely. I think that would be very helpful for people to actually be able to see that on the bill. Um, what are the, uh, the penalty rates now? Sure, the penalty rates now are 5% um, for assessed values uh, of properties of assessed values under 250,000, 18% right. for over 250,000 when, when, right. when the new, yeah. Yeah, okay. And, and just to go back to the idea of the bill again, you also send out paper bills, am I right? Correct. And so- And, the, and that information be put on the paper bills, the, uh, the, the interest rate information? Yeah, so I think what, what, we're, what we can do in the short term, because I know that this is an issue we want to address along with you. What we can do in the short term is include some static content in those bills that then uh, explain the consequences and then um, uh, direct people to the web page where this information is. Um, we will explore it does get a little complex if, if the notion is that we would try to put the exact rate that applies to the exact property on that particular bill will require changes to the system 
as we talked about earlier, right, with, with into the PTS system, and it could get a little complicated. So what I want to do is we will look at it, but at, at least in the short term, we'll be able to put something more um, visible, if you will, on the statement. So then uh, they can refer to the web page with the information. Okay, and there's just there's something on on the um, the property tax uh, delinquency rate. Um, what is that rate right now? The current property tax delinquency rate. So the delinquency rate right now is tracking at about three percent. Um, and how's that um, historic um, numbers? Sure, it compares <laughs> around the same time to about two percent as where we were last year. Um, Last year, we ended up, we ended the fiscal year with a delinquency rate of 1.8%. Um, as you know, as the, as the fiscal year progresses, the delinquency rate typically declines as well. Um, mm -hmm. So we're at 3% right now. We're at 2% at the same time last year, but we've expected to decline further. And what is the delinquency rate for income producing properties? For example, uh, example uh, uh, apartments, class four, commercial space, et cetera. Sure. So, um, so for class two, um, for class uh, two properties for large rentals, the delinquency rate is two point three percent versus one point nine percent last year at this time. And as of March twentieth, the delinquency rate for class four is three point two percent versus one point eight percent at this time last year. So that's a lot higher. Yeah, for class four. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and what are the late payment penalty rates on business taxes and how do they compare to the late payment rates for property taxes and to federal late payment in interest rates? Sure, so in the business taxes, business tax late um, payment interest rates is 7.5%. Um, for property taxes, again, it's 5% for under 250,000 in assessed value. Again, the new tier of 250 to 450, the banking commission has to meet this spring as they do every year. They will come up with whatever the exact rate is for that middle tier. And then for uh, when that is done, anyone over 450,000 that says value will be subject to the 18%. And you know, I think it's important to put these numbers in context. I mean, first and foremost, the interest rates on property tax don't exist to be a revenue raiser for the city. Um, they exist so we could um, mm -hmm. ensure voluntary compliance with those property tax payments, which of course, as we all know, um, uh, you know on which uh, city services depend. So um, when you look at how they compare against other um, major US cities, um, I think you'll find that they're comparable where you know the 18%, Chicago has 18%, Los Angeles and uh, San Francisco have 18%. The 5% for the lower value properties rank among the lowest in the nation. So, um, um, but still, we understand that, you know, there are hardships that are being faced by property owners. At the same time, those, that, that property tax revenue is critical for the city to mount a full recovery for all, so. Okay, all right, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to council who will call on uh, others who have questions. I see we've been joined by my co-chair, Councilmember Rosenthal as well. So good to see you. And um, I think Councilmember Van Bremer has also joined us. So um, council, if I missed anybody, let me know. And uh, would you call uh, those who have questions? Thank you, Chair Drum. Um, I think you have identified all council members who have joined us in this hearing thus far. If any council members have questions for the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you'll be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins. The Sergeant will then tell you when your time is up. We will now hear from Council Member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you so much to the committee council. Thank you, Chair Drum, for an awesome hearing as always. And welcome, Commissioner. Um, Hi, council member. It's good to meet you and I really appreciate, Likewise. I mean, I can already tell by your um, introduction, your statement and answering all these questions that 
um, you know, the stuff like the back of your hand. So that is a, a great pleasure. Really appreciate all that. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions. One, um, you just have to sort of, I'm, I'm a little obsessed with this question for all the agencies, so forgive me. But you mentioned this new state law that would allow the $300 rebate for single family homes. Um, so that would require, I'm just describing, that would require it being passed by the state and signed into law by the governor, right? And um, I guess the most important question is, so do you have, do, do you happen to know if OMB put that expectation into the preliminary budget? In other words, if we were given the right to rebate this money, a good thing, I urge the governor to sign it and the state legislature to pass it. Um, but uh, is that already, is that cost or lost of revenue already assumed in the budget? Yeah, so when the mayor announced um, um, uh, in the January plan that he, he was going to propose this rebate, he identified the cost of $88 million. Um, and so that, that amount will be, um, will be reflected. Uh, so I think that, um, so first, it will be reflected, the mechanism to give the credit is, is or the rebate is an actual credit. Right. So what we want to be able to do is for fiscal year 22 for the eligible properties to be able to credit the amount of money that someone owes on their particular property taxes less than that. Um, so then, you know, essentially, it's also refundable. So if they owe nothing, then they'll be able to get a refund of the amount that they owe. So that is where it will be reflected in terms of the expected property tax revenue. So the amount is 88, the estimated amount 88 is 88 million. million. Yep. And so the mayor issues uh, sort of his, sorry for the noise, uh, the preliminary, you know, the budget a couple times a year, he just issued the preliminary. I'm just asking, does it show a shortfall of 88 million given that we want this law to pass? In other words, by 88, is revenue already projected to be down by 88 million? Or would that show up in another budget, like in the executive budget? Sure. So I, I will also uh, turn it over to Michael Hyman, um, you know, as well. But I would That's say okay. that I think the answer is um, it was reflected in, in the January plan. Yeah, I would go back and double check that. Okay. It's actually really important for the council to know that. So let's just do all, cross all our T's, dot all our I's. I have a sense it was not included in the preliminary budget. So it's a shortfall. In other words, a need that is not yet represented in the budget. But if you could just double check that, get back to me, that'd be great. I'd like to ask a few questions about the audits. Um, the preliminary mayor's management reports that in the first four months of fiscal year 21, the average turnaround time for DOF audits increased to 446 days from 386 days or a 15% increase from the fiscal year 2020 four month reporting period. The average turnaround time for the non-field audits increased to 191 days in fiscal year 2021 from 176 days in fiscal 2020, which is an 8% increase. Is the increase due to the loss of staff, the attrition, in terms of the headcount, in other words, so I'm trying to understand why, why is this? Uh, maybe I should just put that out to you. Why, why do you think this has happened? Sure. So, uh, Here, may a I couple... continue a little bit longer? That's a yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, sure. So, a couple of things. So, I think the number one thing. Look, the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, 
there were obviously um, a lot of employees who were shifted to telework. Um, and I think some of the, and, and also the people who were being audited, the subject of the audits uh, were not in their offices either. Right. So, it, so our audit team really couldn't rely on getting the information that needed to be gotten so that these audits could proceed. So that was part of it. I think the other part of it was on our side to be able then to not only come to the office, retrieve the documents, but also to be able to transition to a telework model. So I think the beginning of the, of the pandemic, the beginning of the fiscal year had those challenges based on the pandemic. Um, and I think the, those were the, those were the main reasons. I think yes, there are some vacancies as well. Obviously, that that does have an impact. But the important point is that um, there is a forecast, and it you know um, audit revenue will come in um, when audit revenue comes in, and we expect that we will meet that forecast. Does the forecast assume the? Um, does the forecast assume the 446 days or the 386 days? In other words, are you pushing stuff into the next fiscal year or how is that reflected? No, well, actually the forecast increased by 250 million in the January. So how is that possible so, if it's taking longer? Well, I think we've, we've recovered. And I think the beginning, the, the, the sort of the, um, stumbling out of the gate, if you will, in the beginning of the fiscal year because of people not in their offices and not being able to get that documentation. Um, we have recovered. People are now accustomed to uh, teleworking and we have audits in process and we feel that we're on target uh, to meet the forecast. Chair Drum, may I continue just a little bit longer? Yes, of course. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Okay, so, I mean, I'd love you to come back to the committee uh, with sort of some some more details on that. It just seems uh, interesting to me that, I mean, I don't know the nature of the audits, you know them better than I do, but it just seems interesting. You have less staff, it's taking longer to do these audits, and yet you're expecting more to come in the door. Look, God bless you. I mean, I hope I hope that happens uh, for the sake of our city's expenditures. But you know, the the consequence of coming of it, of not achieving those goals means cuts to agencies, and so that's why it's pretty important to understand why you think it could get better when year to date it's taken longer and you have fewer staff? Sure, we'll be able to come back to you. Um, I think the nature of the cash flow of the audits when they hit, you, you can't really pinpoint timing exactly on when they will hit, but based on the activity, and again, as I mentioned, based on the fact that uh, our auditors are more accustomed now to teleworking and doing what they need to do. Um, I think that is why we are, are confident that we will meet the forecast. I mean, not to belabor the point, this is the last thing I'll say, you know, given that they're more accustomed to doing that, I could see hitting a target, but there must be something in there in the nature of those audits that you actually think you're gonna hit a higher number. Um, so maybe it'd be interesting to see what the audits are, why, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty big, pretty big jump in money. You know, last year, I'm still, I still have a little PTSD because last year, right, dollars came in much later mm -hmm. or didn't come in. And in the 11th hour, cuts were made to the city's budget that actually hurt programs and people. And so I really want to nail down why you think this estimate is true because if it's not true you know the people we fight for the social service workers or sanitation workers or your own staff given that there's more attrition will be severely diminished i mean you know a couple hundred million dollars here or there pretty soon you're covering the cost of a cola 
for a human service worker. Okay, let me Understood. go on to um, New York City Marshals and the money judgments. Mm -hmm. So New York State Assembly Bill number AO5858 would extend the authorization for the New York City Marshals to exercise some functions, powers and duties as sheriffs with respect to the execution of money judgments issued by the New York City Supreme and Family Courts, um, citing a great need, especially for the enforcement of child support payments the proposed legislation would extend this function of New York City Marshals to 2026. What's your opinion of this legislation? So, yeah, I mean, the um, they've had this, this legislation is an extender. They've had this ability to go into Supreme Court um, to be able to enforce. It's important to note that the difference between what the sheriff does and the marshal does, the marshal is essentially enforcing the money judgments. Um, the sheriff is an officer of the court is servicing the, you know, the orders, the warrants, et cetera. Um, and so um, we are open to it, um, you know, to, to the continuation. I think some of that work is important, the money judgments um, that the marshals um, actually do. And some of the work that they do is on our ECB debt as well. Um, so it's, it's something that, you know, we're open to the legislature if they decide. Okay. I have to say that um, my, my time has run out and the next agency is here, um, but, but being open to it is very different than a full throttled support. Um, so I think we should go both sort of go back and think about, you know, if we're talking about child support, uh, whether or not that's something we're open to or something that is critically important, given that 35% of families in New York City are headed by a single female head of household. 100%, and I'm not suggesting that we would not be supportive. I think in the past we have been supportive. Um, so I think that yeah, all I was simply saying is there's a bill that's pending in the state legislature if the state legislature decides that it wants to grant this additional um, authority and this extension to the marshals, then you know we, we do not object. And I think the... The um, sir, actual sir, the point is, does the administration push to get the bill passed or not? I understand. I mean, maybe you're just saying I'm a functionary in this, but I guess I would hope that Department of Finance would have a point of view and then share that point of view with City Hall and let City Hall know the importance of this legislation to mothers with kids who get no family support, no child support. But maybe I have the wrong- uh, No, maybe it, 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 is, it is something again, that we do not object to. Um, and your point is well taken. And we will, we absolutely concur that the marshal's work on this okay. particular topic is critical and we want it to continue. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, welcome aboard. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Co-Chair um, Rosenthal. Uh, actually, this will now conclude this portion of today's hearing. Thank you to the Department of Finance and to Commissioner uh, for being here with us today. Uh, next, we're going to be joined by the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, and Helen Rosenthal is already here, and we'll, he and we'll hear from the Department of Design and Construction. Um, so, uh, we're just going to switch over now, and then uh, we're going to start right away. Thank you again, Commissioner. Thank you so much, Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you. Chair Drum, would you like to invite uh, Commissioner Rosenthal to start with her opening for um, DDC? Yes. <laughs> oh, actually, all right. yes, thank you. Okay, all thank right, you. so I, I, I didn't no, know. No, no, I'm good, anyway. I'm good. I, 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 I uh... say, in the interest of time, I'm going to forego an opening <laughs> statement and ask the, uh, Chair Rosenthal just go right into her opening statement. Great, terrific. Uh, Council, you can let me know when I can begin. You may begin after, after your statement, we'll swear in uh, DDC. 
Terrific. Thank you so much. So good morning. I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget. I want to begin by thanking my co-chair, Council Member Danny Drum, and the members of the Committee on Finance and the Subcommittee on Capital Budget for holding this virtual hearing today. Today we're going to discuss the fiscal 2022 preliminary budget of the Depart Department of Design and Construction. So I want to congratulate Jamie Torres Springer on his field promotion to commissioner. And only because you know DDC inside and out, I'm not sorry that you're being called to testify before the council on your absolute first day as commissioner. I know you're going to kill it. Starting off with the numbers, DDC's fiscal 2022 preliminary budget totals about $150 million, representing a $19 million decrease when compared to the fiscal 21 adopted budget of $169 million. The agency's preliminary capital um, commitment plan for fiscal year 21 to 25 totals roughly $14 billion and is $85 million more than the, uh, oh, sorry, let me just say that again. The fiscal year 21 to 25 totals 13.7 billion and is 84.8 million more than the 13.6 billion scheduled in the adopted capital commitment plan. There's a little bit of a disconnect there, so I'll be curious to learn more. Um, like many agencies, DDC's work over the past year, looking forward into next year, has been deeply impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Beginning in the early days of the pandemic, most construction in the city was put on hold, thereby disrupting the progress of the city's capital plan. At that difficult time, DDC proved able to expand its focus and play critical role to combat the spread of the virus and immediately respond to the fallout of the pandemic. The agency took advantage of emergency procurement authority and built field hospitals, community clinics, and testing sites. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank Commissioner Grillo and the entire DDC team for their amazing work, including the current commissioner. In January 2019, DDC released its strategic blueprint for construction excellence which outlined its plan to transform how city agencies manage capital construction projects from start to finish in order to deliver public buildings and infrastructure on time and on budget. DDC has already saved five months in the initiation process and three months in the procurement process timeline. The agency expects additional 36 month savings in the design and construction timeline for a typical project should the blueprint pass and be implemented. With the state reopening, DDC will take the lead in restarting the city's capital process. The mayor recently announced work on 17 billion in capital projects is resuming this month. This is welcome news. But given the COVID-19 related backlog of projects, DDC's 262 headcount reduction for fiscal year 22 and DDC's need to address the challenge of implementing the new strategies as outlined in the strategic blueprint plan uh, puts those goals uh, in question. There is a lot for the agency to tackle. At today's hearing, we look forward to learning more about how the agency intends to deliver on the mayor's proposed capital plan. Before I conclude, I just want to thank the staff who helped prepare for this hearing, uh, the finance division and the subcommittee staff, Nathan Toth, deputy director, uh, Chima Oberchiri, unit head, Monica Buchak, finance analyst, Rebecca Chasen, senior counsel, Noah Brick, assistant counsel, and of course, my staff, Madhuri Shukla, Sarah Crean, and Cindy Cardinal. Thank you so much. And I now turn it back to Chair Drum. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. We'll now hear testimony from Commissioner Jamie Torres Springer, who was joined by, I'm sorry, a little technical problem here, um, uh, who was joined by Chief Financial Officer Rachel 
Lazarin. I hope I said that right. I apologize. <laughs> Chief Sorry. Diversity and Industry Relations Officer, Wayne Lambert, and General Counsel David Viroli. Before we hear from DDC, I will turn it over to our committee counsel to go over some procedural items and to swear in the witnesses. Thank you. I will now administer the affirmation and you will be called on to so affirm at the end. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Commissioner Torres Springer. Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lazarin? I do. Mr. Lambert? Yes, I do. And Mr. Verley? Yes, I do. Great. Thank you so much. Um, you may begin when ready, uh, Commissioner Springer. Thank you very much and good morning, Chairs Drum, Rosenthal, and members of the committee. Um, pleasure to be here this morning and we appreciate your uh, kind remarks. Um, very uh, pleased and honored to be uh, asked to take on uh, the leadership role at uh, design and construction by the mayor. And um, you know, as we'll talk about in the testimony, I think we're at a very critical time in how we deliver capital projects for the city. And the city itself is at a critical time where how we deliver capital projects will have a very big impact on the recovery. And so we're, we have lots of uh, things underway to try and aid in that delivery and that recovery. And we're very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you about them today. Um, I wanna just mention that last time we had a budget hearing, I had a little technical trouble on this uh, computer. So I have a second screen set up. And if, if, if you stop hearing me, just please just wave and I'll switch. Um, uh, so um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm a commissioner of DDC and I, I have our, our chief financial officer, our chief diversity officer and our general counsel uh, with me here. Um, uh, this past year has been a momentous one for DDC as it has been for the city overall. Uh, though many of our option, operations were disrupted by COVID-19, we're now in the final stages of reinstating all of our normal activities, including procurements for future projects, as well as our consultant design contracts. This work will fully resume by the end of this month pursuant to the mayor's recent order. I want to acknowledge the incredibly hard work of all the staff at DDC who managed operations and programs throughout this crisis. They ensured continuity, stability, and progress through our portfolio against tall odds. And of course, I wanna recognize the leadership of my predecessor, uh, Lorraine Grillo, who provided incredible stability during the last year and who is really responsible for championing our strategic blueprint, which is a lasting contribution to better capital project delivery in New York City. And I know that the members of the council um, have much longer relationships with uh, Commissioner Grillo than, than I did uh, and are very pleased that she is acting as the, the lead uh, for the city's recovery uh, on behalf of the mayor. So we're all very excited about that. DDC was able to advance several large and critical programs even through the pandemic. And we continue to seek new ways to deliver projects more reliably and more efficiently. Our experience building field hospitals, testing and vaccination sites and other COVID related facilities, <coughs> excuse me, under the pandemic's emergency construction and procurement rules has informed us greatly in this area. And I wanna share some of those insights with you later in my testimony. So first, as this is a budget hearing, I'll give it an overview of our budget. Uh, we're the city's primary capital construction manager. We build on behalf of more than 20 city agencies and we receive capital funding from a number of sources. The January capital commitment plan contains almost $2.8 billion in new planned commitments in fiscal year 2022 for DDC across our portfolio. This includes $1.5 billion for infrastructure projects and $1.2 billion for our public buildings portfolio. The 10-year capital plan includes $8.2 billion for the borough-based jails program related to the closure of Rikers Island as well as $1.35 billion for the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project to protect Manhattan's East Side from East 25th Street down to Montgomery Street. We expect the fiscal 22 budget to grow in the next plan as funding for contract registrations delayed by the pandemic are pushed into the next year. And we're happy to talk more about that during the hearing and your questions. Our fiscal 22 operating budget, um, as you mentioned, Chair Rosenthal, is $150 million. This includes $122 million for personnel services and $28 million for 
OTPS other than personnel services. We have a budgeted headcount of 1,281. Our total operating budget uh, is sourced with $133 million in IFA funding, $16 million in city tax levy funding, and half a million dollars in federal funding. Uh, I want to spend a little time, uh, given how critical it's been on our response to, uh, to COVID. Uh, the COVID pandemic significantly affected our operations, but also offered opportunities and insights into how we can improve the project delivery process. In early March 2020, as COVID overtook the country and a statewide emergency was declared, DDC worked closely with our sponsor and oversight agencies to determine the best way to proceed in a manner that was safe while managing our portfolio through the peak of the crisis. Infrastructure projects affecting water, sewer, and transportation systems were deemed essential and continued without significant delay. However, within days of the declaration, most of our active public buildings portfolio, with the exception of a handful of projects essential to life safety, uh, was paused. Subsequently, consultant design work paused as much of the city locked down and the impacts of the crisis widened. Exceptions were made for critical programs such as Eastside Coastal Resiliency, for projects with outside deadlines such as those under consent decrees or those that had time limited federal or state funding that was at risk of expiring. Uh, Last June, we began restarting our public buildings construction projects in consultation with OMB and our sponsor agencies. We have since returned all projects to construction. And as I stated earlier, we expect all other aspects of our portfolio to resume by the end of this month, March 31st. Spend a little bit of time about uh, talking about our uh, work in the emergency responding to the pandemic, of which we're very proud. <laughs> Throughout the past year, DDC staff performed truly heroic work with New York City Emergency Management, Health and Hospitals, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and others to build and renovate the facilities the city has relied upon to manage the pandemic. Uh, next week, we'll be sharing a report with you and your colleagues describing this work. Got it hot off the press here. Uh, it summarizes our work during the pandemic, during which we, designed and built two field hospitals totaling 1,100 patient beds, designed and built 28 COVID testing sites, designed and procured eight mobile testing trucks, which can be deployed quickly to COVID hotspots. We expanded and upgraded four New York City Health Department laboratories to enable um, PCR testing for COVID. We procured, designed, and built three large COVID-19 centers of excellence for Health and Hospitals and Gotham Help, Health, which are major new acute care facilities in Bushwick, Tremont, and Elmhurst, uh, designed to manage the long-term healthcare needs of New Yorkers recovering from COVID in neighborhoods where more healthcare facilities are very much needed. We also supported the city's Get Cool program last summer, which involved installation of almost 56,000 air conditioning units in the homes of low-income seniors. And now we are aggressively working to create a citywide network of vaccination centers to increase our overall capacity and create convenient vaccination options in neighborhoods identified by the Mayor's Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity as most in need of these facilities. DDC has now completed six large vaccination sites throughout the city with several more in the pipeline. Um, we are working very hard in the field even as we speak, uh, as we prepare for the peak vaccination effort over the next few months. This has been a remarkable effort by DDC staff and it has placed them on the front lines of the pandemic with much of the risk and urgency experienced by other frontline personnel and we're proud of this work. The fact that we were able to deliver hundreds of millions of dollars in construction in mere months shows how effectively we can work when we are not bound by the typical procurement, administrative, and oversight regime within which we normally function. To give you a few examples, that first field hospital we built in Queens at the Billie Jean King Tennis Center with 470 beds went from construction start to accepting its first patient in 11 days. Uh, laboratory upgrades took an average of just over 34 days of construction. The 28 testing sites were built in an average of seven days each. And a particular point of pride for us, uh, MWBE performance for the highest value component of our COVID program, the Centers of Excellence, was extraordinary, reaching 46%. 
our center of excellence projects were built in about six months each, rather than what probably would have been six years, and they came in at or below their forecasted budgets. One reason for this was being able to use a streamlined procurement to award the lead construction contract quickly rather than in nine to 12 months. And then that was a CM build uh, approach to construction, which I'll talk about in a moment. Our success is attributable to several factors. We were freed from the time consuming system that requires city contracts to always be awarded to the lowest bidder who meets minimal qualification requirements. Because of that, we were able to use a value-based selection through a request for proposals process to award contracts to firms with a demonstrated track record of delivering quality projects on time and on budget. Using this system, DDC was able to accelerate project schedules while still delivering projects within budget with fewer delays and fewer mid-project change orders to slow down the process. We were also able to employ con contracting and construction management methods that are not allowed by this low bidder system and the PPB rules, including the construction manager build, or we refer to that usually as CM build model of project delivery. With CM build, a construction management firm is selected through an RFP process and then manages the overall project and holds the underlying contracts for materials, labor, and related services. CM build eliminates the sequential procurement processes of design bid build. It allows construction to begin earlier and much like design build, it ensures critical collaboration between the designer and the builder, which is prevented by design bid build. That's the approach that we are normally required to work within. These may be very technical differences, but in fact, they make all the difference. Other changes that enabled us to work quickly and we believe can be streamlined in the future were reduced public notice requirements, faster approvals from the Office of Management and Budget, the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, and the Law Department, and a shorter selection process. We can also save time on projects if the controller's input is limited to just the items the office is empowered by the city charter to review, which often is not the case now. Many of our infrastructure projects, which remained in construction throughout the pandemic, also saw remarkable progress and were able to be completed well ahead of schedule. We attribute this to decreased vehicle traffic, which allowed us to negotiate more favorable street permit requirements. It's fair to ask, why can't we do this all the time? Why do we have to wait for an emergency to deliver important projects efficiently? The answer is we don't. Already based on new state legislation at the end of 2019, DDC is implementing a design build approach for a number of projects that will save time and money by integrating design and construction activities and avoiding separate procurements in many of the same ways I designed above, I described above. But design build is only one tool and not suitable for every construction situation. I encourage uh, the council to review our year end report that I mentioned early, earlier, which highlights many of these improvements to project delivery. The experience under emergency procurement rules truly brought us closer to the standards of performance we articulated in our strategic blueprint while still retaining important safeguards of public funds. We would welcome discussions with the council about how these rules could be applied long term. The benefits could transform the current cumbersome and costly process of city capital delivery, a goal I know we all share, and provide a greater return on investment for taxpayers. Just an update on our two largest programs uh, for you, uh, the borough-based jails and Eastside Coastal Resiliency. They also continued through the pandemic. Earlier this month, we issued requests for qualifications seeking qualified firms to form the design build teams that will create the new jail facilities in the Bronx and Queens. We continue to monitor legal issues related to the program, but we remain on track to deliver four new jails by August 2027, despite a pause in the jails program at the height of the pandemic. I'm pleased to report that construction began on Eastside Coastal Resiliency in mid-November at the northern end of the project. We've received bids for construction in the southern end of the project, and we anticipate work to begin there in late spring. Um, on our MWBE program, our uh, MWBE program remains one of the city's best, and we're very proud of it and committed to its, uh, its growth and full utilization. We uh, got to a utilization rate of 32%, for fiscal year 2020, which is $257 million, over a quarter billion dollars in spending. 
and was up from 21% in fiscal 2019. In the last five years, our Office of Diversity and Industry Relations has engaged more than 7,500 MWBEs through internal and external workshops and seminars that enhance technical and business capacity. Now we're building on that with a new business development unit, which will be a pathway of entry into public sector work for MWBEs and a new mentorship program that we receive legislative authorization for, which will place emerging MWBEs side by side in the field with experienced construction managers to guide them and provide real world on the job experience as prime contractors. In implementing our new design build programs, we've set MWBE goals of 30% for both the design portion and the construction portion of our contracts to provide more opportunities for MWBE design firms. And I would note, as I said earlier, that the use of uh, value-based selection on all of our emergency work delivered very high MWBE utilization rates. In closing, I'd again like to acknowledge the dedication of the DDC staff who delivered so many COVID-related facilities and continue to deliver essential infrastructure and facilities under very difficult circumstances. And I would reiterate that how that work was performed offers lessons we can and should build on together as we continue to realize the vision of our strategic blueprint and transform capital project delivery for our city. Thank you, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Torres Springer. Really appreciate you being here. And congratulations again to you on um, taking on this uh, position. Uh, well deserved, and uh, we look forward to working with you, as I said. Um, uh, I, I, just before I forget, I, I, um, you mentioned something in, in your um, testimony about the controller and the requirements there. Can you just elaborate further on that for me? Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, and, and thank you for your kind words. Um, sure, I mean, I, I would really wanna place this in, in an overall context. I mean, I think our central message here is over the course of many years and many decades, um, for very good reasons, um, we have you know, severely constrained the public sector's ability to deliver capital projects. And you know, those reasons go back to the last, you know, the 19th century uh, in terms of promoting anti-corruption. Uh, and you know, we, we value, we, we share those values. Those are really important values. I think everyone sort of would argue that, or most people would agree that the pendulum has swung too much in the direction of that constraining. Uh, and we've talked about how some of those constraints really limit us from delivering uh, in, in, you know, in, in time. One of those is the, the certainly the controller's review um, for which uh, in the charter, the controller is charged with essentially making sure that we have appropriated enough money to register a contract and that we have gone through those anti-corruption uh, vendor background checks. Um, and, you know, there are some cases where uh, as a result of, you know, a significant amount of, uh, of a very intensive review undertaken by the controller's office, um, we end up having to produce a lot more uh, and, and spend a lot more time uh, and, and in fact often see rejections of our contracts for registration, um, despite, you know, in our view that they meet those two very narrow criteria that we described. And then we have to go back and forth and it takes us a lot of time to get our contracts registered. And when we're registering hundreds of contracts each fiscal year, both for design and construction, also often having to register change orders as well, which I'd, lo I'd love to talk about um, in this hearing that we have some things we wanna do about that. You know, that really adds up. If you lose a couple of months, every time you have to go register a contract, um, it, it really ends up costing us a lot of time. And that's how we got to these numbers of, you know, taking, uh, you know, 90 months to deliver a capital project. And it's how we, you know, reform to that is how we project that we will cut that number by uh, what, what we're projecting to be three years on average. Thank you. Um, I, and it's, it's good to hear you tackle that issue. Um, it's something that we've been looking at also in terms of the council. Um, but thank you for um, bringing that up. Uh, let me uh, start off by also asking you some questions on the $17 billion 
in capital projects. On, on March 1st, the mayor announced that the city will be restarting the $17 billion in capital projects. And on March 2nd, OMB testified before this committee uh, that many projects are scheduled to restart this month. So which agency's uh, capital projects will be the most difficult to restart? Can you give us a little synopsis of what's going on with the $17 billion? Certainly, yes, Chair, thanks. So that so $17 billion was the announcement the mayor made for the overall capital restart. Um, we're very pleased that as of today, we have restart approval for over 85% of our projects. And uh, by the end of the month, we'll be uh, restarting the other 15%. Um, we'll be at 100%. Um, to your point about um, which are more difficult to restart, I don't think it's uh, sort of an agency to agency thing. There are design projects where, I mean, I'm sure, you know, everyone's aware, you know, there are design firms that struggled to keep their staff, you know, throughout the pandemic and have to go and hire new staff. So it may take them a little time to remobilize. Um, all of our construction work is remobilized. So we're not concerned about that. Um, and we're just working our way through uh, remobilizing uh, for, for the design projects. Which agencies then would you say were most impacted by the cessation of uh, the capital projects? Um, I, I think I would say it was really a, uh, an impact across all agencies, uh, Chair, you, you know, for, um, for all their projects. Um, I, I mentioned in my testimony, we're about 60% uh, infrastructure, which is roads, sewers, uh, water mains. So that work kept on going because that's essential. So, you know, those agencies, DOT and DEP, um, you know, sort of went, went on relatively normally. Uh, also, we're able to uh, design a lot of that work in-house and that kept going. Um, so it was really the agencies where we deliver public facilities for them, you know, our cultural facilities, our libraries, uh, firehouses, police precincts, um, the borough-based jails program. That was where the, the major impact was felt, both through the pause in construction and also through, you know, what will amount to a, a delay in those projects uh, because design was on hold for a number of months. I mean, I, you've heard this before, I'm sure, and in terms of our discussions as well, um, I'm amazed where you have a project like a library that's fully funded, yet the, pro the, the construction hasn't started, and then of course it winds up costing millions of dollars more uh, that needs to be added to the budget down the road in order to be able to complete that project. So, you know, I, I know that Lorraine began a lot of this work and you followed up with a lot of it, matter of fact, it's quite impressive in terms of what has been done. Uh, over the last couple of years or a year and a half or so. Uh, and so I congratulate on that, but um, you know, it still is somewhat frustrating, especially for me, I find with the library um, projects. Um, I, thank you, uh, Chair. And, and I know you've been a tireless advocate for you know, those library and cultural facilities in your district and across the city. And we, we've had many conversations about projects, which, which we've appreciated. I, I, I w if I could speak to that for a second, one, that, that was one of the problems that we identified very early on um, in coming aboard at DDC, which is, you know, the, there was an approach to doing it, which was basically um, a project would be conceived, the funding would be identified, and it would get sent over. And then, you know, DDC would sometimes say, well, you know, this isn't enough money, or um, this scope actually can't be built. Um, but we would get stuck because the project had been initiated. So a number of years ago, we created a unit called front end planning. And now every project that comes over goes through a, about a 60 day review uh, to identify if the budget is adequate, if the scope can be built. And we basically don't start the project until the scope is very clearly defined. And we've also, and this has sometimes caused friction and been difficult, after we're finished with that, we say to all of our stakeholders, uh, including you know members of the council, also our sponsor agencies, that's it. We're not changing the scope unless we discover something that would prevent us from building the project. And we're working hard to enforce that, which is the way I think of avoiding those change orders, those additional costs, clear definition up front of what the project is, and no changes unless we absolutely can't avoid them during design and construction. And Commissioner, I know from some of our discussions as well, the issue of accessibility um, is important also. So hopefully that will be on the mind of everybody who's designing these projects, that accessibility is a top concern for the council and for DDC as well. It's a deep commitment uh, that we have, uh, ADA and universal accessibility. 
Um, we've taken a number of measures recently, um, including that we have uh, a senior ADA uh, official within our public <coughs> buildings division, he reports directly to the deputy commissioner for public buildings, Tom Foley. Um, uh, I will say, you know, even in, I've been very involved in building out our vaccination sites the last couple of months. Um, he's coming through, uh, taking a look at the project, making sure that each project will meet, uh, you know, not not just wherever we can, not just ADA standards, but going beyond it to universal accessibility. And we, we, we're very committed to that. Great, thank you. That's really so important. Uh, so how many projects has uh, DDC been able to restart this month? Um, the short answer is all of them. Uh, I don't, I'm going to ask Rachel if she has a specific um, month to month number to add some color to that. Yeah, we don't, we don't have a specific number. Um, so we, we have gotten approval to restart all of our projects. And as Jamie said, they were in various phases. Um, and so really, um, you know, we, they're, they're all approved to restart at this point. Um, and it's been it's been a gradual you know return because construction came back first on the public building side, um, and then things that were in active design came next, and then the next pieces are the items that are in procurement or about to go into procurement. Right, Though that's kind of like the last tranche that's, that's moving forward. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Again, thank you for your um, emphasis on design build. Uh, and as you know, on December 31st, 19, the governor signed into law chapter 749 of the laws of 2019, which authorized several city agencies, including DDC, to use the, the, to use the design build method for projects over $10 million that are subject to a project labor agreement. Design build was also authorized for certain other projects over $1.2 million, including pedestrian ramps, libraries, uh, security and infrastructure. Can you explain how DDC has been able to use the design build? I know you mentioned some of them um, in, in, uh, generally in terms of um, your testimony, but how have you been able to really use that over the last year? Thank you, uh, Chair, yeah, really, appreciate the opportunity to talk about design build. First, I, important to go back and, and just uh, recognize there are many um, heroes of that success, uh, parents of that success. And I, I actually uh, really want to acknowledge um, we have many unsung heroes within city agencies. Um, our general counsel, David Veroli, was uh, a, a tireless advocate, made many trips to Albany. He was really the the, the brains behind the advocacy for design build, which is such a transformative change for the city and for the state. So I really wanna acknowledge what David has accomplished with that. Um, and then in terms of implementation, um, we have been working very hard on this. We took advantage of the, 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 the time during the pandemic to basically overhaul all of our systems. We had to create a whole series of new uh, rules and standard operating procedures, uh, draft new contracts, uh, new RFQs, RFPs, uh, and work our way through a lot of very complex details on that because this is really a brand new approach for the city. Um, as a result of that, we basically have, I'd call it sort of two general uh, programs. One is the Borough Based Jails program for which uh, we're very excited that uh, a few weeks ago, we registered the first ever design build contract and work is now underway on the preliminary construction on the Queen site. Uh, it started this week under a design build contract. So it just went from registration to work in the field uh, within a couple of weeks. Um, the other stream is that we have uh, identified uh, basically a pilot program with nine projects um, uh, across our portfolio. They include uh, critical community recreation centers, uh, operations and maintenance facilities for the parks department uh, and infrastructure work uh, in, in the streets of the city. Um, and those are in various stages of initiation and procurement. Many of them were in the market with RFQs and RFPs seeking design build proponents um, for those projects. So we expect those to advance very rapidly over the next few months. That's great. Thank you for that information. Um, what is the headcount devoted to implement design build? And have you had to use staff to do design build that took you took staff away from other projects? Um, 
Rachel, do you want to address that? Or do you want me to? No, I, I can address that. Sorry, I had to unmute. Yeah, um, yeah thank you. So, um, you know, the projects that we're doing using the design build method are projects that we would have undertaken anyway. They would have gone through a traditional design bid build project uh, cycle. Um, and so we're utilizing um, the existing staff. Um, you know, they're still assigned to the projects. Uh, the project staff are the same, you know, that effort. It's, it's a little bit higher, um, right? Because it's a brand new program. And so we're setting up these procedures and contracts, et cetera, for the first time. Um, but we, you know, we've able, been able to shift um, within the existing resources. Okay, and what are the characteristics um, of a project that um, you know you would identify uh, to use uh, design build for? Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I'd say, um, council member, we're um, we're in the, this pilot stage. Um, we uh, basically what we're getting set up to do is I mentioned earlier our front end planning unit. So they have a set of criteria that they're applying. Um, uh, you know, but sort of boil it down. We we need projects that are where things are pretty clear up front. And you know, no surprise in construction in New York City, that's not that many projects. Um, you know, for, just to give you an example, um, we're quite hesitant to go and just do a design build project for a regular street reconstruction with uh, sewer work and water main work uh, underneath because you know honestly we we don't always know what we're going to find um, and that's why sometimes we have these frustrating uh, you know times of how long it takes to build these projects and also we're dependent on the utilities um, for uh, for often um, relocating some of their infrastructure, although uh, we are we are actually making quite a bit of progress on that, which I'm happy to talk about. So, but because of that, that's not a suitable design build project, um, and so we're working in this pilot to find projects that we can, um, you know, that that don't have a lot of scope change, um, don't have a lot of sort of mysteries or unknowns up front and that we can lock things in and proceed with the design builder. And we're gonna work through these pilots and we're learning a lot about what's an appropriate design build project. Uh, just not, not to uh, deviate too much from my line of questioning, but you said something that um, I wanted to bring up, which is that, uh, uh, are you working also with parks? Um, I have an issue uh, where um, they're refusing to plant trees in existing tree pits because the utilities are saying that they um, it's too dangerous to put a tree in the pit where there used to be a tree. I don't get it. If it wasn't dangerous before, how is it dangerous now? But the utilities have been um, you know, not willing to, to work with uh, parks on this issue. And I would really like to see some type of work done on that because uh, we can't deforest New York City. Definitely agree with that. We do a lot of work with parks. I'm not familiar with that specific situation. I, I will just take the opportunity, um, council member, to say we've been made it a real priority to coordinate upfront with the utilities. We now have a monthly meeting with the utilities um, where a lot gets resolved. And then we've moved up um, their design reviews when we're designing these major street reconstruction projects so that they're in the process earlier. Um, and uh, I can look into that specific situation uh, for you, but but uh, but it, it does get very complex out there. I would love to talk with you about that um, because actually I almost had a preventive fist fight from occurring in my office on this very issue, not with me, but with the utilities. So we'll talk more about that offline. Sure. Um, uh, so what is the estimated cost and project duration savings the agency is expecting to achieve by fully implementing design build? Um, I, I think uh, that um, I, I would may, Rachel may want to say something about that, but um, I, I would uh, I would say that we're continuing to develop the program um, and we'll be able to give more information as we proceed through the projects. We, we know for sure that we're saving nine months, nine to 12 months on every design bill project because we only have to go through one procurement, not two. And then we estimated in the passage of the legislation, we'd see. Uh, in the order of a 6% savings. Um, you know, it's, it's actually, it becomes quite complicated um, because, 
in some ways, it's the avoidance of all the additional costs that we run into from delays and discovering new things and having to go back and redesign and all the escalation that happens. We avoid all of that. And a lot of design build is about transferring risk um, for some of those unknown costs to the design builder. So um, we're, you know, we're looking forward to studying that and quantifying it, but we do expect them to be significant savings. Okay, and thanks, Commissioner. My last question is going to be, uh, as we were preparing for today's hearing, uh, I noticed that there was um, the um, language authorizing progressive design build. Can you explain to me what's the difference between regular design build and progressive design build? Well, yes, we, we, it's true. It's we're, we need to work on that terminology because we, uh, especially in our you know, city, I'm, I'm progressive. I, no, no, no. Right. I, I used to be a progressive anyway. Especially in our city, you know, everything needs everything, you know, should be progressive um, and is progressive. The, um, uh, you know, what, what we mean there is basically it's, a, it's somewhat of a technicality, but um, there's a way to approach uh, design build that we're not authorized for by the legislature, which is basically that we can just use full quality based selection, bring on a team right away and then we can work on the project together without locking in the budget uh you know up front and uh that would be certainly that's you know that that's how the private sector builds um you know they they bring on their team everybody you know gets in the room and you figure out how you know how to design and deliver the project that would be the maximum flexibility um we're working with the pilot the you know the legislation and piloting that uh, in its existing form and we're finding ways to implement that and and having progressive design build would be an additional tool in our toolbox so, so it's the funding piece really that determines the difference in terms of uh, the degree to which we're locking in the price uh -huh. right. yeah okay thank you very much and i'm going to turn it over to council now uh thank you chair drum um we now have questions from Chair Rosenthal, and I just want to acknowledge that Councilmember Lander has joined us. Uh, thank you so much. I actually, if Chair, if uh, Councilmember Amphrey Samuel would like to go next, I know her hand's been up for a while, and I have quite a few questions, so I just wanted to uh, let her let her go first. I really appreciate that because I really do have a meeting and I was just telling my staff, oh my goodness. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I'll make this very quick. Um, so uh, Commissioner, you mentioned the front end planning that you're doing now. Um, and my question related to that, and you already know what I'm about to ask probably. Um, I have two, and not to make this district specific at all because I know that we're in a budget hearing. But just so that I can understand the process while we are doing the budget, I have two um, projects in my district now. The boxing gym, that's a NYCHA project that was originally a $1 million cost attached to it. And now there's $10 million over the course of two years. And we've had this conversation before where I asked how to jump from 1 million to 10 million. And then there's another um, a project in my district under DDC, which is the community center 444 Thomas Boylan that had an original cost of 25 million. And in last week's meeting, that project jumped from 25 million and now I'm being told that it will cost $100 million. And so last year during the budget, we removed 10 million from that 25 million to go to the NYCHA project so that we can at least move forward with that NYCHA project. And so my question is why, like did these two projects have the front end planning and you know, like what's happening just so I can know how to plan accordingly when it comes to allocating funding or fighting for dollars for my district? Yes, thank you council member. And I, I do want to acknowledge that Every time we see each other, we talk about this, which is which we appreciate, and and I, you know, I'm glad that we do um, because uh, these projects are, I know, very critical to the administration, uh, to the mayor, uh, and to you, and and our our transformative projects for your community. Um, so, I mean, I, I actually. Um, Earlier on, I was mentioning how we've started to use this front end planning process to 
get much more clear about what a project costs and what its scope is and whether it's constructible up front. And I think these are two really good examples of that. Um, the, as I understand it, the boxing gym, as you said, um, while it was uh, sort of conceived uh, with that budget number, when we took it in uh, over here at DDC, we immediately put it through front end planning and identified that there were a lot of issues. And, you know, I think we all know this is sort of, this is, this is underneath these, this many billions of dollars of, um, of difficult unfunded capital needs that NYCHA has. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, that, that's sort of an example of it is that, you know, in fact, if you're going to go and build a recreation center in NYCHA, um, once you really start looking at the building, it doesn't cost a million dollars. We found that it, it, you know, we need, we just needed basic safety, structural improvements, and the budget did increase. Um, the good news is we're, um, about to start design on that. Um, as I think you're aware, um, we're just waiting for our CP from OMB that, that will get us started. And then we have a two-year schedule uh, to and plan to complete construction very quickly. Um, certainly plan to engage with you and the Tenants Association after design starts and work together on, on what the design looks like. Um, the Thomas Boylan, uh, uh, 444 Thomas Boylan, um, I know that that is uh, a Homeless Services and uh, Human Resources Administration project that is being sent to us now as an initiated project. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is take it through front end planning. Um, I hadn't heard that uh, that new number. That sounds like breaking news from a recent uh, meeting that you had. Um, I'm going to follow that up and find out exactly what's going on with that. But I will just say that that's now we're at the beginning and we're going to you know do the right thing and figure out exactly how much it really will cost to build that project. Thank you so much, chairs. Thank you. Sure, council member, I'm a little bit actually um, confused by all those answers, but I can tell you understand it. And I was and, gonna uh, ask you, I was actually gonna text you and then after this um, hearing, ask for you to explain it to me. <laughs> okay, we're in trouble. But the one thing I do think that we have to check that the commissioner mentioned is uh, getting OMB to release the CP for the building. It's my understanding that all CPs, I guess it's tomorrow, will be released by March 25th. So do you expect it to be in that fourth tranche that they've talked about? Um, I, I would just say, I think this is a slightly different, this is just the normal process of uh, that CPs have to be reviewed by OMB to, you know, to make sure that we have a adequately budgeted and scope project. I, I think I can also say on behalf of my I'm colleagues. Oh, Thank uh, you. No, keep going. I can also say on behalf of my colleagues at OMB, um, we uh, we also, you know, the, leave aside the pause. We also all recognize that that capital initiation process does take too long, um, and we're working together on improvements to the CP process as well. Yeah, I just um, I, I would encourage you, Councilmember Ambry Samuel, to reach out to City Hall on that. Um, I'll give it a look. I have a list of those projects. I'll give it a quick look. Um, but you and I should talk about that later. It's a little concerning. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, and I have been totally in that situation. So I get that. Um, so Commissioner, I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the amazing blueprint you have. And then uh, think about that apropos all the um, uh, um, all the tweaks you were able to make in during the pause with the executive orders. And so all those things that you were able to sort of um, skip over. And I'm curious, um, I mean, I'll look forward to seeing the newly released blueprint um, to see the specifics, but is, is it right in, to understand that during the pause um, with, with the executive orders, you were able to save um, eight months in total, five months in initiation and three months in procurement? Um, thank you, Chair. The, um, I think this is actually 
lots of different sets of savings that we found. So one, I think um, what you're describing is from the implementation of our strategic plan over the last three years, there were sort of two big time savings that we found in projects. This is not emergency projects. This is regular projects. Oh, I see. I see. We, we've much accelerated our project initiation effort. Um, and so I think we said we saved five months there. And then through sort of the low hanging fruit of procurement reform, delegations from oversights, you know, lots of different things saved on average three months for the average project. During the pandemic, we've saved years. I mean, the best example to me is this, these centers for excellence that we built for Gotham Health, where they honestly, six months from start to finish instead of probably six years or more. So that's stunning, right? And it, it, it emphasizes the imperative to, um, to probably um, to put into law, change laws, change procedures to allow those hurdles to go away forever, right? Maybe 100%. that's a simplistic way of saying it. No, uh, and, and I, I can mention that. I can just expand on that if you like, if you'd like Please. me to. Yeah, um, so, the, so um, th that's absolutely right. The, the overall problem is this, this idea of having to accept the lowest bid. That's where it all comes from. It's general municipal law 103, state law. Because of that, we have to use design bid build. We have to fully design a project, then bid it out to the builder. No you know, work can happen between design and construction. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, also we, you know, are, can't go with the, the quality, the, the highest quality. Um, so um, one way that that's been relaxed is through the design build legislation. What we did during the pandemic is called CM build that I described in the testimony, oh, okay. which is basically you can hire an integrated team and the CM can manage the project, the design and the construction of the project for you. We're able to get great MWBE results, able to you know shave a lot of time off, and we came in uh, with those projects on budget or under budget. So that's another way that legislation could help us if we were able to use that approach much more. Um, not asking you to you know give away any wonderful information, but could you sort of uh, talk about the if you could? Do you think you could put different have different buckets? of like legislative reform, you know, state level, city level, um, yeah. controller reform. Um, what would the different buckets be? And could you give a sense of either time or money or neither for each bucket? Sure. Um, a lot of it um, is at the state level and we would love to have the council support for those initiatives. Um, that would be, you know, getting more alternative approaches to delivery that um, I mentioned CM build, um, other ways that we, um, uh, Chair Jerome mentioned uh, expanded design build, which would be a goal for us as well. We also, um, there's a um, program related to insurance uh, called owner controlled and uh, contractor controlled insurance programs, OSIP and CSIP are the acronyms we use. And uh, those actually the school construction authority is able to use those. Basically, it means that every smaller contractor, including the, our MWBE contractors, now they have to go out and get their own insurance, which is incredibly difficult and actually right, right. limits their ability to participate. So instead, we're able to hold insurance on their behalf um, and we could save a huge amount of time and money with that. So that's another big state uh, initiative. At the city level, um, We've mentioned uh, a number of streamlining that could occur. Um, you know, uh, also some uh, rule changes to the to the PPB. Um, we've also mentioned that there's Local Law 63, um, which is a very good law, uh, important way to make sure that uh, the city is um, is you know maximizing employment for uh, city employees and work for city employees, and we fully support that. It does have an unintended consequence of delaying, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, our um, procurement for design professionals and for um, for uh, engineers, uh, supervising engineers in the field. 
And so um, without at all impacting the protections that that puts in place for city employees, um, we think there are some ways that that could be modified to reduce the amount of time it takes us to procure the, the, uh, the design consulting professionals. I see. So wait, could you explain that one more time? So there's local law 63. Does that apply to expense or capital? Um, it's, uh, it's capital. I believe it's all capital for just for professional services. But yeah, it's, 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 it can be capital or expense, but oh, it's, right. it's more about the category. Um, so it doesn't apply to construction, but it does apply to all professional services or standard services. And the way DDC uses professional or standard services is um, as a part, I'm just trying to, to tease it out because yeah. Local Law 63 is so incredibly important and valuable um, for city employees. So, and I, I think a very important piece of legislation for to make sure that we're not, you know, simply, you know, avoiding using city employees and therefore contracting out. So could you explain, I, I'm just still not quite sure on how you tease this out. I think I, I will ask Rachel, if you don't mind to explain it as she's a lot of, a lot of procurement experience, a lot of experience yeah. with local law 63. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, as I said, it's for um, professional or standard services um, for contracts over $200,000. Um, and in the DDC universe, uh, we, you, you know, that impacts a few different areas. One is the design contracts um, that we do for our public building side. I think the commissioner mentioned earlier um, on our street and water main and sewer work, a lot of that work is designed in house, but where we don't have the expertise um, and we're using design firms um, through a procurement process uh, that is impacted by local law 63. But um, Rachel, with design build, would there be a possibility that we would skip over your in-house work? Yeah, design local law 63. Um, again, right now it's not codified in um, the PPB rules, but it is, you know, we are not subject to local law 63 for that. And, you know, local law, we were not subject to local law 63, um, you know, during the pandemic and the emergency related procurements either. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, uh, um, just to ask you one more time to clarify, what is the change that you're asking for in local law or, or that you would be asking for in the blueprint for local law 63 or the tweak? Yeah, so I mean, the I think the, the unintended consequence that the commissioner spoke about is, is this additional time. Uh, so the, what the law requires is that there be public notice um, of these contracts in advance. Um, so we, we, we put together an annual plan and we say these are the projects we anticipate using design um, in outside design firms for or outside resident engineers, um, in which case there's actually no, when we do that in advance, there's actually no impact to our schedule. Um, that's publicly noticed. Um, it's available for everyone to see. Um, and then we just proceed. But, but what happens, you know, throughout the course of kind of life and, and um, you know, psych budget cycles and changes um, that occur throughout the year, um, new projects are come up or they move forward. Okay. Um, and if we didn't have those projects on our Local Law 63 kind of procurement plan in advance. Which we you then had put forward at the beginning of the year. Correct, right. So that plan is published every July 31st. Um, and it's anticipated, it covers the full fiscal year. Um, and so if we, if we miss that opportunity, um, then we have to go out with public notice again, right? Sure, For that sure. specific project. Sure. Um, it's a minimum of a 60 day uh, public notice period. But and then why isn't it still important? Why, why shouldn't the people who could possibly doing, be doing that work in house 
have a chance to have that work? I mean, absolutely. Um, but, but keep in mind, it's right now, it's sequential. So there's a, a 60 day plus, really, because there's an administrative step before the public notice. Um, there's a 60 day pause where you are, we are not able to start a procurement. So one of the suggestions is to have that notice period run in parallel with our procurement. Our procurements are certainly over 60 days. Um, so while that notice is available, if there were concerns um, that people wanted to raise, it could happen I see, in I parallel. See, I see. Um, and how, and, but how would it be able to stop a procurement? If somebody um, said, okay, I'm seeing this procurement's going forward and you're letting me know that you're not gonna use in-house, you're using cons outside consultants. Could somebody say, hey, wait, why can't you use in-house? Would that stop the procurement? So that could, could yeah, it definitely could. I mean, we're, I just want to be clear. We're talking about a, a in the in the universe of the cities contracting a small number of contracts um, that are for professional design consultants at this agency. You know, we again we have we local law sixty three serves a very valid purpose in protecting city employees that we uh, you know would not purport to to uh, disturb at all. But you know, there's a sort of technical fix here for a very small subset where. Mm -hmm. You know, it's obvious that we're going to use uh, design professionals, professional design services, since we use them for all of these projects. Um, so, you know, wait, that... wait, wait, sorry, I'm just going to tease through that sentence, if it's all right, Commissioner. It's obvious we're going to use design professionals, in other words, consultants. What if you hired those people and had more people with those skill sets in-house from the get-go? What is it about the nature of the work that these design consultants do that's different? Yeah, the, so we, we do have an in-house design capacity, um, but we, you know, we, so, you know, we don't have uh, hundreds of uh, highly qualified uh, architects and engineers to do that design work. Um, you know, it would take a sort of massive expansion of the size of, uh, of DDC. And, and, you know, it, it's some of these uh, buildings that are being designed and require the type of specialized skills that, um, we, you know, we wouldn't be able to have a staff that, you know, as permanent staff that maintains those skill sets. I mean, you, you need to be, you know, working on multiple projects across the country and around the world and so on. And that's those the specialists basis for, work on yeah, projects it's, around it's the really, world. Yeah, it's really specialized work that we can't hire for. Can you give two examples? Um, or one. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, most of our um, most of our external design work, or all of our external design work, is for our public buildings projects. So the design of some of the the, the major buildings in the city. And why can't your in house staff do that? Well, they they do. There's in house work that's done, but um, but you know, as I say, there's a lot of specialized skills in the the architectural and engineering work for the design of those buildings. I'm a total lay person. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an architect. I'm just a mom, stay-at-home mom. So I don't understand what specialty. I'm hoping you'll say a word that is a subspecialty of architecture that I can then understand why you don't have those people on staff today. Yeah, maybe we should come back to you and try to give some more specific examples, Chair, since this is a, an interest of yours. Um, I, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, it's, it's really, you know, this is about sort of, you know, major building design, right? I mean, if, you know, we have buildings that cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and we have a whole, you know, architectural firm working on it. Um, right, but you're also down, as you mentioned, over 250 positions, right? Because you have a hiring freeze. Now, I don't know how many of those are in the design subspecialty unit, can I ask you, can I just make an analogy just because I'm trying to understand this and I, I, again, total lay person, but you know, like if, if in, in the field of medicine, right there, you can say somebody is a heart specialist, but 
you know, then there are like three different valves. So people become specialists of each of those three different valves or somebody becomes, you know, because it, it, there are certain individuals that have these little micro health issues that only, you know, one doctor in the country knows how to treat. And you, you know, you sort of have to find that doctor. Is that an accurate analogy? So that number one, number two, how many people are you down in that design, you know, engineering architecture uh, division at DDC right now? Yeah, I, I want, glad you asked the question about headcount. Do you, Rachel, do you wanna clarify on our headcount, first of all? Yeah. Um, so I want to. I just want to clarify something about Local Law 63. One of the requirements of the law, um, I think, the general intent is is to ensure that the city is not contracting out for work, um, be, um, because of you know shortfalls in headcount. So every time, um, whether we're putting it on our annual plan or we're adding it to a plan, we're looking at a specific project. Um, we have to make a determination that we are not outsourcing work that could be done by city employees. That is a specific, a very specific function. Um, it's a requirement of the law. I mean, each, each time we're certifying that is that it is a very specific function that the city employees do not have, which is why we're contracting for that. Um, so we, we definitely, uh, we are not contracting for designers or resident engineers more because of any change in our, our structural headcount. Um, but, but you are correct, we, uh, we, we see in the FY, um, you know, in this preliminary plan, a reduction in our headcount. Um, that is a reduction in our budgeted headcount. Uh, those were all vacant positions prior to the pandemic. And I think kind of uh, in a like fiscal responsibility, OMB said, well, you don't have the, these positions aren't filled right now. We're in a hiring freeze. Um, so we're, we're just gonna remove them from your budget. Um, we, we still have some additional vacancies. And as we work to fill those, you know, if we have additional needs, we will work with our partners, obviously at the Office of Management and Budget, if additional headcount should be required. So again, I'm really sorry to be thick. How many people in your budgeted headcount, and there were vacancies, how many of those vacancies are in the unit of architecture, design, whatever the, that particular subsection that sometimes you contract out with, with local law 33 professional services. How many professional services staff are you down? I, I'm not, I, I don't know if Rachel has that number, but the number would be sort of in the, you know, if there's an, you know, we would have vacant heads of in the, the tens or the, the dozens, you know, whereas okay. the, the, there's, there's, you know, there's sort of tens of millions of dollars of work that we, uh, require professional design consultants to do. I mean, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a major part of how we deliver. So it's not, I don't, I don't want to hazard a guess as to how much we would have to increase the size of the agency by, um, it, it would have to be hundreds and hundreds of people. And, and then we wouldn't have the specialized expertise still to design these, these major projects because you really, you know, the, the work gets done by architectural and engineering firms um, in, in this world. Oh, so it's not just one person. It's a whole firm that yeah, yes. does yeah. this type, type of specific yeah, engineering. Yeah. yeah. And the, the great projects that we build, you know, you see, you sort of see them, they meet these very high standards of design. We, we describe this now as project excellence, um, you know, design and construction excellence. We rely on firms that are designing buildings all around the world um, to deliver this very high quality architecture. Um, increasingly over the last few years, we've placed the emphasis on, we have to be able to construct it. Um, and it's not all about you know, the fanciest building, but that too is a real specialized skill um, that you know, a firm might be designing a building in the private sector and be able to bring lessons um, and expertise about how that building was designed and delivered to, to DDC um, and to our public buildings. Okay, you know, uh, and this is just one piece of 
the state legislation, city legislation that would have to be changed. Um, I think we should have a hearing on all of this so we can, you know, as soon as your blueprint comes out, so we can really understand what we gain and what we lose with these changes. You know, so kind of like you're saying, Rachel, there were unintended consequences in passing Local Law 63. You know, I would then ask the opposite. Could there be unintended consequences of making this tweak um, that, that you're suggesting? Happy to, happy to keep going, continue that conversation. Thank you, Okay. Jen. All right, I think I've beaten it down to a pulp. Um, so, uh, do you expect in the executive budget that there might be an increase to head count? I mean, just given that the mayor announced 17 billion in commitments this year, will realistically, are you gonna need um, an increase to head count in order to, to make that happen? So I'll take that. Yeah, I'll take that. Um, so we, we don't, the FY21 budget, a head budgeted headcount is actually a little bit lower by about um, 50 um, compared to FY22 already. Um, you know, that is down from prior years. As I mentioned, those were vacancies. Um, and, you know, we are working with OMB. We are still subject, I, I know the council is aware, subject to kind of a slow return um, of hiring of city, the city workforce. Um, so you know, we do have existing vacancies um, that we are working to fill. Um, to the extent that our portfolio grows and we are able to fill all of our existing vacancies, uh, we, you know, we will continue to advocate, um, you know, if, if we have additional needs beyond that. And so if um, the city, if the stimulus money doesn't come through for six more months and the city all of a sudden said to you, you know, we need to take a further reduction, what would the impact be? Well, I, I think, it, Rachel, if, if I may, I just want to uh, emphasize the, the, the major point Rachel is making is our reduction has been in vacant headcount. So we were operating, we were delivering over $2 billion a year in public infrastructure and buildings with the staff that we had and still have. And we will continue to do that and are confident that we can do that. Um, so... Um, I'm sorry. I've now, now I've forgotten the precise question that you asked, Chair. But that, but that, you that's and me the. Both. Yeah. <laughs> but that's that's sort of the the major point is you know we're we're gonna we're gonna build back, uh, continue to fill va fill vacancies, but we are in a very good position to deliver this work. Okay. Um, I'm gonna ask your side to do a little research, but I'm gonna continue on with my questions in some other areas. But can I ask uh, you, Commissioner, to ask someone on your team to look at the exact wording of Local Law 63? Just to really, maybe there's a, a you have a legal person on here. Um, because I, I want to understand the definition of displacement and what local law six, how local law 63 defines displacement. Okay, and we'll circle around to that to the mm -hmm. at the end, if you could ask someone to do that while I'm asking other random questions. Sure, Chair, and we're happy to do that. I do just wanna say that that's really a conversation that we should have with the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and the Law Department, and we'd be very happy to have that conversation. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think we're, you know, we're just here to say, you know, just there's a number of different things we can do to help streamline procurement and oversight. That's an example of one of them, um, and certainly something that we would we would love to engage more. But we'd we'd love to bring the mayor's office of contract services and the law department to that discussion. Well, maybe that's the answer then. Let's as a follow up to this, let's have that meeting. Love to do that. Okay. All Thank right. You. I appreciate that. Sorry, just a few more questions. No, please. Um, so the front end planning, which Councilmember Drum asked about, Chair Drum asked about. Um, 
Are all projects now going through the comprehensive front end planning process? Yes, they are. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and is there a way to expand the unit in the future to even improve the pipeline? Yeah, thank you. I, the, it is our intention to continue to expand front end planning. Um, there's a number of things we can do. Uh, one of the realizations in creating the strategic plan that we have was that the city as a whole can use more, um, uh, you know, really capital planning. I mean, we have a, an office at city planning that does what we think of as sort of the inputs uh, to that, the outputs of that um, are, you know, where we can use help and, you know, where we can do even more work. Last year, um, we did a pilot with the Brooklyn Public Library where we looked at five of their libraries well before there was a capital project for them and evaluated mm. them so that they could go and get the funding that they needed based on really understanding what was needed for the library. And that's really our aspiration for front end planning. Um, I think we call that part of it advanced planning. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I also recognize uh, uh, Councilmember Lander is, is on and has been a strong advocate for that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and we, yeah, we'd, we'd love to do that in the future. Mm -hmm. Do you need more staff or do you need anything for that? Well, it's, it's been in our plan and it's something, you know, frankly, now that we're coming out of the pandemic where the focus has mm -hmm. been on emergency work, including for our front end planning unit. I mean, they've just been an enormous resource for us all over the city, you know, figuring out how to build out these testing centers and vaccination sites in days, sometimes hours. Um, we, re we have to take a step back and revisit, you know, who's doing what and, and how much more capacity we need. Yeah, and I, I, do, I do want to just add to that, that um, we actually have dedicated funding and headcount in our budget for okay. the front end planning unit. Um, so they don't just get shuffled around. It is, it is dedicated. Um, and to the extent there are vacancies, they, they go right back to that unit. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Um, a quick question about your active projects. Um, I'm wondering, it looks like roughly 60% of the agency's capital budget, uh, consists of projects for DOC and DOT. Um, you know, as a council member, you know, speaking for my colleagues, how do you, is there a way to prioritize the projects to make sure that smaller projects are not left behind? Certainly, yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's an important question. I, I would say every project we have is a priority. Every project is assigned to a project manager, um, receives the appropriate level of, uh, of management. So, um, you know, it's, there's not a, it's not, there's not a sort of pecking order um, or prioritization. We're trying to advance everything uh, at once. And we, and we have done a lot of work on smaller projects um, uh, that we haven't had a chance to talk about, but um, for example, creating more pre-qualification lists for the, the uh, designers and the contractors that will be doing that work. Um, also, you know, and I hope we have an opportunity to share more about our MWBE promotion efforts. You know, that's where um, uh, smaller projects often can be led by MWBE firms that are smaller uh, in scale. And we've had lots of success with that. So it really is a priority and it's the bulk of our work. I see, I see. So actually maybe could spend a couple of sentences actually talking about that. I'm familiar when I was chair of the committee on contracts, I looked at SBS's um, MWBE outreach and networking sessions. Um, do you do yours in conjunction with them or something different? I, I'd love to ask Wayne to, um, to expand on that. I do want to say, you know, that it, um, I want to recognize that Commissioner Grillo made this a, an enormous priority for the agency. Mm. We saw results, as mm. I mentioned, over 30% MWBE in fiscal 20 and it certainly is a major priority for me to keep that up. And, and I wanna ask Wayne, uh, who's the perfect person to do that. Uh, okay. I wanna ask Wayne to explain some of what is on our agenda. Great, thank you. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Chair Rosenthal, for your question. Uh, you know, I wanna start by saying that, you know, we understand here at DDC that as we go, so does the city in terms of MDB utilization and performance because of our large spend and budget. Uh, you know, to that end, we understand the implications of the work that we do here, and we strive to be the leading agency as it relates to MABE uh, uh, performance, but also even the, the initiatives 
are partnering with our oversight, uh, like you mentioned, small business services and other city agencies. Uh, obviously, the work that we do falls under the purview of local law one, but also outside of that, um, you know, with design, build and other projects under local law one. You know, we do adhere to the rules by the uh, uh, lip, uh, that we get from the mayor's office of contract services and others. Uh, you know, we try to make sure that we set high goals on our projects. Goal setting is a critical part of the, uh, the uh, has a critical impact on MJB performance. So we try to set goals and we take it one step further, not only setting just an overall goal, we set the segregated goals, for example, to ensure that, you know, the opportunities are developed out across the board and more in an equitable manner. Um, we were actually the leading agency in doing that. And now the mayor's office of our MJBE has now pushed other city agencies to do this That's as a great. part of their goal setting process. Um, not to, you know, uh, the commissioner talked about the, the number of initiatives that we're proud of. Again, we're also we're proud of that and the fact that during this fiscal year, we set the highest goal on a city procurement um, over 40%. Um, Sweet. So again, we're pushing the envelope and we know that when other agencies see that, they're going to try to, you know, uh, you know, the agency, we do get competitive. Uh, yeah, I like so that. Yeah, we get competitive and we definitely set goals and we want to be the leading agency, as I mentioned earlier. Um, again, talk. Uh, the commission also mentioned, uh, mentioned the mentoring program, right? Um, we're carving out a number of projects um, solely for MBEs, and we know that this this program is successful. We've seen it at our, at our sister agency, SCA. Um, you know, we don't have all of the the, the same flexibility as SCA and MTA. Um, you know, there was reference earlier to also CSIP being sort of a barrier for MBEs. Um, you know, we're pushing on the legislative side to get that move that forward. Um, you know, but the mentoring program we hope to launch by the end of this year. And oh, okay. like, yes, um, and we're actually very excited about that. Um, and that was a baby of, 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 of Commissioner Brillo and still now. And um, also, uh, yep. the question, oh, sorry. Also, um, and, and so that's there. And then also, you know, we do have an MDB advisory committee that we work very closely with. Um, you know, many of those members are on the citywide advisory council. Um, team as well, but they often serve as our eyes and ears on the ground. They give us a pulse of what MBEs are experiencing because many of those members are also MBEs and went through many of the same challenges. Yes, with them very frequently. Um, you know, to the extent that we have a committee, we have subcommittees. Um, we get their input and, and you know apply it to our processes. We make uh, we take the suggestions very seriously. Um, and I talk with those folks every other day, oftentimes, they text, call, all that good stuff. Um, so we definitely want to make sure that we are um, you know, engaged with the MBB community and getting the word out there. Um, I talked also about outside of local law one, right? We have design bill and we're pushing the envelope there. Um, you know, historically design bill usually has an a overall MBB goal. Um, you know, we made sure that we set the goal on the front end and the back end. So it's not only on the construction side where we know that the building teams tend to historically, you know, they'll backload the opportunities from MDBEs. And those are usually smaller types of projects, but we have strong MDBEs who can do great work on front end as well. So that's why we made sure to include a goal there. Um, we're building out a team to help monitor these large projects. Again, it's new for the city and new for DDC, but we want to make sure that we start off on the right foot. Um, we have sessions solely geared towards MWBEs coming up. We call them forum sessions or forum series. I um, mean, again, they're targeted to MWBE so they can fully understand, you know, all of the gist of our, of our design build. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's, it's easier and more efficient, but there's some com uh, complexities there as well. And what our MWBEs to understand it, again, thinking about the work that we do in the long term, right? We want to help vendors now, but we're thinking about getting rid of these disparities over the long haul. Nice. Uh, well, so, so, nice. so I can talk about this stuff all day long. So, uh, I see that, and you're answering all my questions, so I don't even have a follow up, which is really bumming me up. So, I might have to ask you a curveball question. Um, so, I've been very active uh, developing the worker cooperatives mm -hmm. yep. in the city, and there's a wonderful construction committee that a uh, construction firm that is a worker cooperative. Um, so just putting that out there. Oh, totally, totally. And that's another step that we should take in, in terms of MBE, right? Thinking about how, you know, because when you have employees who buy into the company, right? We know that, you exactly. know, they're, you know they're, they're, they're more engaged, right? Um, and they, 
And so, so yeah, so that's definitely one of the next step for us um, in the advancement of the MJBE program. Wow, because, you know, um, Deputy Mayor Thompson actually has um, co-opted some of our worker co-op uh, work to be the employee ownership mm -hmm. model. Um, that would be amazing to hear that you all are part of that initiative as well. Totally, yes, we definitely are involved here at DDC. Um, I actually came from the Mayor's Office of MJB as well and worked uh -huh. with Deputy Thompson's team. Um, so, you know, so I have a little cheat sheet there on, on, on that front. Um, you know, we, you know, uh, you know, they, they are doing the work there on the citywide side, but again, the hope is that we share information with MJBs across the board um, to help build up the companies and get more resources into the companies. That way they can grow and expand and have more capacity to work on many of our projects here at DDC, not just the small ones, but the larger ones as well. Yeah, I got nothing. That, that was great. Thank you for that. That's You've exhausted my list of questions because that was amazing. Um, so commissioner, I have to go back and bust your chops about one other quick thing before I wrap up. And that is the capital commitment rate. Um, so uh, DDC, you know, and of course this is all, you know, with, through the lens of COVID, you know, understanding the impacts of COVID. <coughs> but, um, DDC had an actual commitment rate of 873 million in fiscal year 20. And that was um, a 72% commitment rate. Um, what percent is committed in, oh, no, 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 sorry. What I meant to say was that is so much lower than fiscal year 2019 which obviously was a banner year. And you know, you're know you on this trajectory like this where in FY19, it was 124% committed. Um, so what's, what's your anticipated commitment rate for fiscal year 21? And um, yeah, that's my question. Yeah. Um... The, uh, we certainly pay a lot of attention to the commitment rate because it shows whether we're meeting our our goals. And I, I might ask Rachel to speak to any specifics. I will just say, you know, I, I mean, it's been a difficult year, um, you know, for everyone, uh, personally and professionally. Yeah. Uh, this pause that we've been on um, has certainly, you know, as you said, we could see it in fiscal 20 um, that we didn't commit uh, nearly as much as we intended to. And, and yeah, I mean, we're not going to get to our commitment rate for fiscal 21. There will, there will need to be projects that are pushed out into fiscal 22. The good news is, um, you know, based on that fiscal 22 will be an extremely good year for commitments. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know if Rachel, if there's anything you want to add to that. Uh, no, I, I think, uh, you covered it really well. I mean, the, I, I mentioned this earlier, the, bulk of our commitments traditionally, you know, happen in the last quarter of the fiscal year and with the pandemic kind of um, starting in, you know, March of 2020, uh, that was, you know, kind of the worst time just yeah. from a commitment plan rate, which is why you saw that number drop. Yeah. Um, and as we spoke about at the beginning of the testimony, the, the restart, um, you know, the last piece to come back was procurement, right, which is uh, affects our commitment plan. So we are restarting the procurement kind of machine, um, you know, now and have been over the last few weeks, but but there's only so much time left in the fiscal year. And, and that is, is why, you know, this year as well, we are probably not going to achieve certainly not the over 100% um, than sure. in the past, but, but, but we are very much um, on track, you know, for, for next year. Um, I think we had mentioned this in a, in a prior hearing um, about capital restarts that um, it's possible we flatten out and that we have many more commitments in the fall than, than we might in a typical year. Right, 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 right. So the seasonality is gonna flatten um, no. because of the pause. Yes. So the fall should be a good, you think is, is gonna make up a lot of the shortfall from 21? I mean, we will see, we will see because the, you know, the whole budget obviously is being reviewed now, but um, you know, in terms of our workload, that is certainly how it's trending. Okay, great. And you've already sort of answered this last question. Um, 
could you estimate what the impact of the strategic blueprint will be to your commitment rates? And, you know, part of that is the stuff you figured out that you can do on your own. And then a chunk of that will be, you know, what is required by state or city legislation. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the way I'd put that, um, I'm not, I'm not, I have to think about how the commitment rate would be impacted. I mean, we set our commitment rate based on sort of each year, our projection of how much we're going to get into contract. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, and that's, that's a function of how, how fast we're working, but also how much is funded, you know, how, how many projects are funded. So I, so I have to think about how we'd impact the commitment rate, but I think the most important thing is our durations, our timelines for finishing projects. And mm -hmm. we're very, we're, we're very pleased, as I mentioned earlier, that before the pandemic, we had shaved on average six months off the parts of projects that are at the front end, the time it takes to initiate them and the time it takes to procure design and construction um, uh, contracts. So we would already saved the six months. Our projection is that uh, we have an additional three years of savings that we'll Jeez. get out of uh, the design and construction phases of projects. And it's that's it's for a lot of other, the reasons that we've talked about, alternative approaches to delivery. Um, haven't had a chance, and I'd love to just mention quickly uh, that we're also working on minimizing change orders um, yeah. through an integrated unit we've created and something called an expanded work allowance, um, where basically we have an allowance up front for things that normally become change orders so that they don't have to become change orders. Um, and then also uh, the other big thing that we've done uh, there's actually a few more things, but um, uh, we have now put much more aggressive durations uh, into our contracts. So we're telling our designers and mm. our, our contractors, you must build this project much faster. And we're incentivizing them to do that. We're giving them the tools to do it um, in terms of resources, uh, IT systems, the expanded work allowance and but it is very much our expectation that they're going to deliver and there are incentives uh, for them to do so and so we expect as i said overall to get our average project down by about three years that's insane i look forward to that hearing to hear about more of that more of that in detail and what the council can do mm -hmm. to yes. to help make those changes so thank you all so very much and i'm going to turn it back to committee council Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. I see we have uh, a question from Councilmember Lander at this time. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Look, mostly I just wanted to come on and say congratulations to the new commissioner. Uh, Jamie, congratulations. Uh, I wanted to be here for your first hearing. It's so well deserved, but it's also so urgent for the city at this moment, the opportunity to move forward out of this pandemic with investment in our infrastructure and our capital projects with you at the helm is great and all the work you have already put in to streamlining and improving project both timeliness and efficiency and planning is really great so just a couple of quick questions uh first you know uh, one of the projects that uh understandably got delayed by the pandemic is our capital projects tracker database uh for which we passed the law about a year ago uh, but I just heard from City Hall that that process is back up and running. We're going to be convening the advisory group. And I know DDC has been doing just a lot of that kind of work, all the kinds of work you've been describing. So, um, you know, how do you see that fitting into this broader set of reforms? Yes. And thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member, for your, your kind words. Um, the uh, It's very much a part of it. Um, you know, we know that this isn't only about delivery. This is, you know, about transparency, so that we're demonstrating, uh, you know, what what public dollars are being spent on, how effectively we're working, and I think that initiative that you mentioned is an important part of that. I, I do also. I, I'm also aware that we uh, have that advisory committee restarting, and um, we certainly have been collecting the data. So now it's just a question of working with our our colleagues, our oversights at OMB and elsewhere to make sure that we put that that system in place. Um, so we're looking forward to Super. that. Super. Well, I'm looking forward to that and hopefully that can be kind of a part of the, the, this shared project between things the council can do, things the administration is doing across a lot of agencies. Um, all right, two bigger picture questions. Um, you know, uh, uh, this week, the Biden administration has started pushing forward with a, you know, $3 trillion infrastructure program. Um, 
if you know if anything like that passes you know just like so many fingers crossed it would be a lot more money coming down to cities like new york to invest even more in our infrastructure so it's all the more important that you're working on this whole set of issues but obviously you know ramping up that quickly that you always wind up in this debate about what are shovel ready projects how can you take so i guess my question is you know we don't know yet the contours of that everything is moving so quickly in recovery but what would it look like to get ready for something like that and imagine taking advantage of an opportunity to do a once in a generation set of public investments on the top of a system that's already doing so much and you know challenged to deliver quickly for all the reasons that you have described yeah uh, thank you it is a very hopeful time in terms of uh, infrastructure um regionally and in the city i had a couple of answers i mean w one is that you know, we as the construction agency, you know, projects are fully funded when they come to us and then we, you know, we design and build them. So that would, you know, presumably result in more projects that are fully funded coming to us, um, uh, you know, and, and any sort of gap filling would occur at the, the level of, of OMB. Um, I would say much of what we've talked about is really about enabling us to mobilize much faster and the design build uh, pilot that we're doing in particular you know, we can get into construction uh, from, you know, from project initiation into construction within months. And that is a huge change. We also mentioned earlier, uh, and, you know, the sort of best example of being able to accelerate is uh, the work of the agency during the pandemic, where, you know, we built field hospital, a field hospital in 11 days. Um, we built, you know, $120 million worth of state-of-the-art acute care facilities for health and hospitals and Gotham Health uh, in six months that from uh, from conception to uh, completion, which normally would have taken us six years or more. So that a lot of that was the ability to do value or quality-based selection um, and to use the CM build model of uh, delivery. And if we had that uh, legislation uh, from the state that would allow us to do that, we'd be able to mobilize much more quickly to deliver on those those uh, priorities. So it sounds like uh, if that, uh, when that happens, let's say being optimistic, um, that it'll be worth focusing on both state level and other city level changes that we might want to wrap around the infra the federal infrastructure package to make sure projects can be delivered through it quickly, which will probably be a condition of the federal funding in any case. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, last question. And this in some ways, you know, it's, I, I was struck, you know, when you were talking about the fact that so many of the things that make it take longer were put in place for very good reasons. Um, and then they accrete over time and it's hard to remember either what the value was or how you really get it out but you know yesterday the mayor announced this racial I'm equity expired. commission and um you know it struck me that that fair share and kind of achieving a fair share of um uh you know projects across the city is sort of one of the rules that has and i wonder how you think it is consistent to make sure given what we've seen in the pandemic given our desire for a more just and equal city how we balance, you know, a real intentionality about equity in our capital project delivery with also wanting to make sure we get the projects delivered on time, create the jobs, get the projects done. It, um, no, no, no small question, council member. I, the, you know, I think that has a lot of different aspects to it. I mean, certainly um, the, the equitable distribution of capital investment is something that on the capital planning side, the administration has taken very seriously and there's work that the Department of City Planning has been doing on that. I also just wanna say personally, um, for the last few months, I've been very involved in the siting of the vaccine centers and yep. the mayor's task force on racial inclusion and equity and some work that they've done. There's actually a report that's been put out just identifying the zip codes where we are most in need of these interventions has been absolutely what? critical to helping us target um, where to place those centers. So I, I think that's a very good model. And then, you know, probably in some ways more importantly for DDC is the work that Wayne has been describing. Um, what we can most do to advance racial inclusion and equity is help to build the, the capital within MWBE firms um, and you know, ensure that they are creating viable businesses that can prime contracts, because um, that's really how you start to, to you know, fill the wealth gap, um, build up the capital in those businesses in, in our city. And we really believe very strongly in that. 
Super. Thank you very much for those answers and even more for all this work and to you and your whole team. Congratulations. Thanks, Council Member. Thank you. Okay, Chair John, I don't see any further questions. Um, should I pass it back to you? Yes. So um, just I, I, I just want to mention, you know, uh, small business services also included LGBTQ, similarly to how they're working with um, MWBE, and would love to ask you to consider the possibility of doing something along the same lines uh, with what DDC is doing as well. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'll, we'll look. We'll look into what that what what SPS has done with that. That's certainly an important objective. I don't know if Wayne has anything off the top, but we'll, you know, we have to go see if there's there's some something additional we can do. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, and then thank you, and thank you, Chair, uh, for your question. Yes. So SBS, they do have uh, they they uh, they do have a program known as the EBE or Emerging Business Enterprise Program, and the push from Small Business Services um, is to get uh, you know companies who don't who fall outside of the purview of the MDBE program to apply for the Emerging Business Enterprise Program. Again, that program speaks to more socially or economic disadvantaged circumstances. Um, it's a bit more difficult to get certified into, hence the reason why there's a low number of certified firms right now. Uh, but, you know, the city does encourage LGBT um, uh, folks who fall under the LGBT um, um, uh, uh, label to, if they meet the requirements of MDABE, to apply for that in the meantime. But right now, there's not a program necessarily for LGBT. Um, the closest one is the EBE program. And we ensure that, uh, I mean, and there are goals um, uh, based on the uh, disparity study for the EBE program as well. Um, so we will definitely look into that and again, as Commissioner mentioned, whatever SBS is doing, you know, we're a partner um, and we support any effort that they make to try to advance, um, well, one, make sure that equity is across the board um, for all companies and all businesses. Sure, great. And I would love to have that discussion and the trees <laughs> uh, with you both uh, later on and, and another point. But anyway, I think that's going to conclude uh, what we're doing here with you now. And I uh, just want to read this statement. It will conclude this portion of today's hearing. Thank you to the Department of Design and Construction for being here. We will now take a short break, maybe 10 minutes or so, uh, before we begin the public portion of the hearing. I ask my colleagues who will be joining us for the public portion to remain in this Zoom with your microphone muted until we are ready to begin. And thank you again to DDC, to everybody, our new commissioner, for joining us here today. Great job. Thank you. Look forward thank to working Thank you so with you. much.
All right. Are we good to start in again? We are. Okay, great. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Helen Rosenthal. I chair the subcommittee on capital budget and we will now hear from the public. So I will now turn it over to committee council to go through some procedural items and then he will call up the first panel. Thank you so much. Okay, we will now hear testimony from members of the public. Please listen for your name as I will be calling individuals one by one. And we'll also announce the person who is next. Once your name is called, please accept the prompt to unmute yourself. And the Sergeant Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to three minutes. I would like to now call on Henry Garrido, um, followed by Ralph Palandino. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify today. Uh, we will be providing written testimony um, for the committee for the record. But I wanted to take an opportunity to discuss some of the earlier conversations regarding uh, DDC's positions on the amendment of Local Law 63. Let me be very clear. Local Law 63 was not passed or intended um, as designed to be a protection of city workers only. It was primarily a protection for taxpayers in the wake of the city time a scandal, which led to the biggest and largest municipal fraud case in the history of the United States. And that was the contracts with uh, SAIC at the time. The construction contracts that we're talking about were not limited to that. We saw increasing amount of cost overrun as a result of uh, changes, change orders and admissions for many of the agencies, including DDC. And I'm surprised, actually I'm shocked to hear by the newly appointed commission that they're part of the first efforts to include this blueprint is to amend local law 63. When in fact, it is our position that DDC is violating local law 63 as it stands right now. Because the local law 63 definition of displacement was quite clear. It wasn't just displacement as it exercised the layoffs, uh, but it also meant any uh, funded position that were in the budget, including those who were uh, covered by attrition. And I'm surprised and glad, and, and I really want to thank Council Member uh, Helen Rosenthal for bringing this up, that while DDC has 250 vacancies plus, um, it is still going ahead with contracting out a lot of work. Let me say that their discussion and proposal that design build is the solution to a lot of these uh, bottlenecks that they created um, of, you know, of their own making, right? The problems that they created is, is ridiculous. And the city tried to amend design build and it wasn't until DC 37 joined the, the uh, coalition and push over and it, what this legislation was changed and done. This is not the solution. And the solution is not to remove the checks and balances that were put there in the first place. The solution is to get the agency to act more efficiently by, rather, by, by informing the council, the public, and by protecting the city workers by having a procurement plan that reflects accurately what they're intending to do with the budgeted amount of money that, that it's allocated. Uh, there is a bottleneck, there's no question about it. Local Law 63 is not, in our opinion, the reason for that. And lastly, I will say this, um, there, the, the city, its solution to a budget deficit is always to put a PEC program, a project to eliminate the grant, and that includes attrition. And about a month ago, we had a hearing with this contracts committee that essentially argued I'm expired. Um, that the local law 63, and at the time, you know, they pointed to uh, the mayor's office of contract, who then responded and said, not our deal. Um, and so we really need to clear this out for the future of the city and for the betterment of our procurement policies. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman um, and um, Mr. Chair as well. So thank you everybody on behalf of DC 37. Thank you so much. Can I just ask you, do you have one more minute? I know you're a busy guy. Um, I am, I am, uh, Madam, yes. Uh, any questions that you have, I'd be glad to answer. I mean, actually in the field, at a construction site, oddly enough. Well, we're doing some work here uh, where members are doing work. 
Oh. And we came, we came to check on a safety issue here. Right, you're every day more amazing than the day before. So here's my question. Um, do you, what they seem to say was, help me parse this out. They seem to say, yes, we're fine with doing this at the beginning of the year, but sometimes as the year goes along, there's an emergency building thing that needs to happen. And I'm guessing that they would give examples um, during the pandemic of we had to build a field hospital, right? And that had to happen in a minute. But what did you think of that argument when she said this is for really only, you know, sort of the unexpected projects? Right. Well, with all due respect, I think it's a false argument because by her own testimony, emergency procurement is not subject to local law 63. That's number one. Number two, mm. there's nothing that prevents. In fact, if you look right now under the mayor's office of contract and look at DDC's uh, procurement plan, you would see that they've amended the procurement plan on the local law 63 three times within a matter of six months. So there's nothing that prevents on the local law 63 the premise to amend the position that you have when you first did the procurement plan. The issue is removing the checks and balances that are there, including cost analysis. It's not just about displacement, including is, can you build capacity in-house as you mentioned? Are you depriving the city of the institutional knowledge that it needs by bringing contractors that come in with a low bid, hold you uh, basically hostage as the project is going and then delays are occurring. And then you could say, well, we need more contractors to complete the work that a previous contractor did. And lastly, the point that you make is really critical, which is we cannot have con consultants supervising consultants. We saw that at the city time. That We've was seen city it time, time and again, right there. Right? Yeah. Once you have that, there is no quality assurance. And we're not saying every project should be done by city workers. We acknowledge that. But where the institutional knowledge needs to be transferred, we need city work workforce to yeah. be there. Yeah. And secondly, we need city workers to oversee these contractors because otherwise they don't have a responsibility to the city or to the citizens, their responsibilities to the bottom line and to maximize profits. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your effort. Thank you for being here. Thank you for testifying. And for sure, if we have this follow-up meeting, you know, I would, I, we would want you to join us. Thank you, Councilwoman, it's an honor. Always a pleasure, thank you. We will now have Ralph Palandino, followed by Kelly Grace Price. Time starts now. Good day, um, local 1549 clerical administrative employees, uh, President A. Rodriguez. I'm stepping in for him today, pinch hitting, it's baseball season. Um, our requested items, uh, if placed in the final budget, uh, will save taxpayers dollars, generate tax revenues for the city, and enhance public services. Um, essential workers pay is coming into the city and the state that will go directly or should go directly to those workers who are frontline essential workers in hospitals, in the police department, et cetera. And we wanna make sure that the money is spent and spent it the way it's supposed to be spent um, uh, for the proper people. And the clerical area, the clerical associates in hospitals were frontline workers all the time. 911 and 311, the same thing, and the eligibility specialists for SNAP, Medicaid, and HASA also. So we hope and we'd like to make sure that they are included in any payments. The spending power that they can generate from those payments will help small businesses and also increase tax revenue from those businesses for the city. Other items that would save tax dollars and generate savings is civilianization of the uniformed services, especially the NYPD. Um, this should be also part of the police reform that's going to Albany. Uh, this is an old issue. Uh, the stop the attacks on the civil service system and save tax dollars by making sure that higher paid non-competitive titles are not taking civil service positions and doing while they're doing the same work. That is also a savings. This is not an intra-union fight. This is a budget issue and tax dollar issue. Um, in terms of the hiring of eligibility specialists that have been drastically reduced in 
uh, HRA, uh, which has increased the error rates and also the timeliness for SNAP applications was reduced as well. Um, SNAP has administrative funds coming to it um, through it uh, to cities and states in this federal stimulus, by the way. And uh, we are opposing uh, the bill in Albany, uh, the way it's written now, it must be reformed, S3223 and Assembly 5414 until it is revised. It should not be mandatory that the person getting the service um, have to use the phone line. It should be their choice and it should not be permanent the way this bill is written. Um, the other thing that we need to have is use some of that money to hire the 911 people and 311 people that are severely understaffed and also use the interpreter title, uh, which there may be even money for in the stimulus package for all we know, instead of using all the highly exploitative uh, contract services. And so that's the Time summary expired. of the presentation. And I just wanted to say to both chairs, um, uh, to, uh, well, Dan, uh, Chair D Drum is not here right now, I don't think, but uh, he's always been very cordial and very friendly and also very cooperative. And I want to thank him. And also to Chair Rosenthal, I have testified at about five or six hearings and you have been at every single one of them. And I don't know how you do it, but keep up the good work. Thank you. And thank you for that testimony. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we have Kelly Grace Price, followed by MJ Okma. Thank you. Time starts now. Ms. Price, it looks like you're unmuted, but we don't hear any audio. Are you able to speak with us? I think we'll come back to you um, if, unless you're able to resolve your audio issue. Okay, uh, moving on, we will have MJ Okma followed by Jessica uh, Sink. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is MJ Okuma with the Human Services Council. Um, at the last finance hearing several weeks back, I spoke about how over the past year, a city contracted human services workers for majority women of color were not provided PPE. They were not given a COLA in the fiscal year 21 budget, and they were not afforded job protection while the city and state disproportionately cut human services, resulting in a net loss of 44,000 jobs in New York City. One of the extremely damaging cuts from the city that fed into this crisis was the retroactive dismantling of the indirect cost rate funding initiative before it was ever truly implemented. Since that last hearing, Box and OMB have told human services providers that they will face another staggering retroactive cut of up to 70% of their indirect funding for fiscal year 21 contracts with less than four months left in the fiscal year. This cut was announced at the same week the federal stimulus pack package passed, bringing an additional $6 billion to New York City, yet still, the city refuses to pay out their human services contracts as promised. This cut of up to 70% for this fiscal year is far larger than the incredibly damaging 40% retroactive cut from fiscal year 20, which was condemned by nearly half the city council, the controller, and all five borough presidents. And this larger cut will only be repeated in fiscal year 22 unless funding is included in the upcoming budget. To address this crisis, the fiscal year 22 budget must include $171 million to fully honor the ICR initiative as already committed by the city of New York. This $171 million covers $91 million in total for fiscal year 22, $57 million for fiscal year 21, 
in, in um, 23 million for fiscal year 20 to fill in the gaps between the cost of the city's commitment to nonprofits and what is actually included in the past, in the past two budgets. I include a detailed breakdown of these numbers in my submitted testimony. Um, the fiscal year 22 budget must also support the human services workforce with the restoration of the COLA at a rate of at least 3% and comprehensive emergency pay for city contracted human services workers retroactive to March 23rd when the stay at home order was put, first put into place. New York City Council saw the crisis facing the human services sector and fought for the ICR funding initiative and for the human services workforce in fiscal year 20. Then as we face COVID-19, cuts were disproportionately imposed on the sector, creating widespread layoffs in a crisis much larger than what we faced in fiscal year 20. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, for providing me this opportunity to testify and for your partnership on this issue. We greatly, um, we greatly value your support, and we're counting on the City Council to include the needed $171 million for indirect funding in the preliminary budget response next month. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, MJ. You're, you know, really appreciate your taking the time to testify here and to submit your testimony. And you know that I'm going to do everything we can to get that money back. It's just outrageous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we will have Jessica Sinke followed by Nadine Duncan. Time starts now. Good afternoon, committee members and chairs Drum and Rosenthal. Thank you for hearing testimony today. My name is Jessica Sinke, and I'm a policy analyst at FPWA. FPWA, FPWA is a anti-poverty and policy organization with a membership of 170 community and faith-based human services organizations in New York. We strongly support the city strengthening its partnerships with nonprofits by fully honoring the indirect cost rate funding initiative to provide adequate investments for FY21 and beyond. Because of the interdependent nature of city and nonprofit contracts, the city is not able to deliver certain services without nonprofit partnership and nonprofits are not able to operate without government funding. But when given proper resources, nonprofits are equipped and empowered to respond nimbly to changing needs of the communities they serve with efficiency and cultural competence. FPWA stands with the sector in strongly urging the city to fully implement the ICR initiative. We also ask the city to retroactively award emergency pay to human services workers. The contributions made by such workers in the height of the crisis were and are absolutely essential. A just recovery from this pandemic requires that we retroactively award these workers with emergency pay to March 23rd, 2020, when non-essential workers in New York were ordered to stay home. We also ask the city to invest in sector-specific human services contracts, for example, with Department for the Aging. In FY20, over 4.6 million meals were delivered to over 31,000 homebound adults across NYC, and the need for that has only increased since. In FY21, the city pays reimbursement rates that fall short by approximately $2 a meal. This results in thousands of dollars lost every year for nonprofits. And as such, we request an additional 16.6 .6 million be included for the home delivered meals program in FY22. Additionally, we request the 10 million for senior center staff and 5 million for their kitchen staff, which was promised but not included in the preliminary budget. Another critical area in which to invest is youth services programming. Cuts to Summer Sonic will leave 43,000 students without programming or support this summer. It's critical that youth have constructive activities that support their well being and recovery in the immediate and in the long term as well. With this in mind, we urge the city to fully restore the $25.7 million cut from our students to restore Summer Sonic. Lastly, I'll highlight the comprehensive background check backlog within the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene for early education providers. Since this backlog is so dense, many providers across the city are still waiting for their clearances to come through even now. Department of Mental Health and Hygiene must be given the resources it needs to appropriately clear staff quickly and efficiently. In closing, the FY22 budget can either lead us to recovery in a more equitable and to lead us to be stronger Time than expired. before, or it can deepen and further entrench the inequities laid bare by this pandemic. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify and please know that FPWA stands ready to work with you on this front. That's thank a you. big statement. Really appreciate the support of FPWA. So thank you for that. Thank you for testifying. I also want to mention that we've been joined by Minority Leader Steve Matteo. 
Thank you. Next, we have Nadine Duncan, followed by Ravi Reddy. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Nadine Duncan, and I am the controller at Sheltering Arms. Thank you, Chair Rosen Rosenthal, and also Minority Leader uh, Mateo, um, and the members of the Committee on Finance for the opportunity to submit a testimony. Sheltering Arms is one of the city's largest providers of education, youth development and community and family well-being programs for the Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn and Queens. We serve nearly 15,000 children, youth and families each year and employ more than 1,100 staff from across New York City. Um, restore funding for the indirect cost rate initiative, ICR. First, New York City's FY22 budget must honor the city's commitment to cover providers' true indirect costs by including $171 million in ICR funding. This investment in the ICR in initiative is the primary risk to organizations like, like sheltering arms. It is unconscionable that, the New York, that New York City would commit to this initiative require providers to go through a lengthy process to demonstrate actual costs and then refuse to pay, pay providers to the full rate approved by the Mayor's Office of Contract Ser Services, MOX. Through the ICR, Sheltering Arms was approved for an indirect cost rate of 13.46%. However, under the current executive budget, MOX is only able to honor a rate of 10%. This reduction will result in a gap of approximately $2 million in critical indirect funding across our FY21 contracts. This funding is needed to support our core infrastructure that allows us to continue providing high quality services to our communities across New York City. Things like upgrading and maintaining our payroll systems to ensure staff are paid accurately and on time ensuring that our technology across 50 sites, including 20 residential sites and hundreds of home offices are effectively meeting the needs of increased reliance on internet, including video meetings and therapy sessions, remote learning and file sharing. Example, improving Wi-Fi, maintaining computers and laptops, upgrading licensing for log me in and VPN access. PPE and cleaning for administrative staff and services for staff whose work could not be completed remotely. Example, our facilities team continue to make deliveries of PPE and donations to our residential and program sites. Our accounts payable team, which must continue to print paper checks to ensure our bills are paid. Um, We're lucky to have received CARES Act funding, however, financially uncertainty at the city state levels mean that the financial future of our agency is also uncertain, driven by a board of directors to remain cautious. With more than $6 billion slated for New York City, which more than covers the anticipated shortfall of $5.25 billion for FY21, there's no excuse for the city to not base not baseline the full 91 million that the Office of Management and Budget has said it is needed in order to fully fund the ICR for FY22 and to restore the 80 million needed to make providers whole for retroactive cuts made to the ICR for FY20 and 21. Full funding for the ICR initiative is critical to our ability to continue providing high quality services to children, youth and family across New York City. Um, I'm not sure where I'm with time. Um, well, I mean, if you could wrap it up, but Controller yes. Duncan, you're making so much sense and providing so much good insight. Um, is your, has, have you um, entered your testimony for the record? I am going to um, enter it for the record, yes. Okay, if you could please do that. Um, it's all read and kept and used um, yes. for, for the city's analysis. Um, and I appreciate you so much. If there's one sentence you wanna give just to wrap it up. 
I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today and that the City Council's partnership on the issues impacting our sector and our communities. I am happy to answer any questions, any additional questions you may have. Thank, thank you and you. have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. And as a reminder to all to submit written testimony, you can email testimony at council.nyc.gov. Okay. Next, we have testimony from Ravi Reddy, followed by Magdalena Barbosa. Time starts now. So thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, from the Asian American Federation to testify this afternoon. I'm Ravi Reddy, the Associate Director for Advocacy and Policy at AAF. Uh, we're here to make sure that our community's needs are on the record before the Committee on Finance as we work on the FY 2022 budget and especially in light of recent events. Top of mind for so many in our community is rising anti-Asian violence. Our seniors are isolated due to the pandemic, but it's a fear of violence that keeps them from venturing out as we look to the pandemic recovery. Our small businesses are teetering, many are already bankrupt, but 60% of our small business owners say in a recent survey that fear of anti-Asian xenophobia has impacted themselves, their staff, and their establishments. So we're gonna to cut to the chase and get to a few asks, some ways that city council can help us. Uh, we need help uh, with getting support for the efforts of trusted Asian-led, Asian-serving organizations to centralize reporting of incidents in order to connect victims to the services they need. We need investments in community-based programs such as safety ambassador programs that can connect elders and other vulnerable community members to trained volunteers who can escort them on the streets and safely de-escalate situations as needed and provide for recovery services in Asian languages to help victims heal from the trauma such as victims funds and mental health support. And so much of this work requires supporting the organizations within a community who are already doing the work. For example, AF has provided direct technical support and capacity building services to over 100 small business owners along Union Street Flushing. Our small business program functioned as a critical hub for business education and as a critical conduit between the city and our small businesses. However, this program ended in January and, you know, we're still seeing demand for this service. We're still seeing demand for this beyond its uh, current boundaries. So we're asking for an investment of $1 million so that we can keep it going. And when it comes to immigration integration, this budget is a pivotal opportunity for our government to regain the trust of our immigrant communities. To this end, City Council must set aside $2 million for immigration legal services funding for community-based organizations with a track record of providing not only immigration legal services, but also the case management services that can link our community up with them. And on top of funding a fully and consistently implemented Local Law 30, we're asking City Council to fund a community legal interpreter base bank with $2 million and commit $250,000 per worker co-op for three language translation co-ops covering Asian, African, and Latin American languages, from providing employment opportunities in our immigrant communities to relieving strains on existing CBO capacity to providing interpretation, the benefits would be multifaceted. And especially in our direct services work and those of our member and partner organizations, we need city council to step up to the challenge to address the access and capacity issues of our service providers with an initial $2 million investment to provide culturally competent mental health programs ranging from formalizing community education programs to capacity building efforts and replicating successful program models by training mainstream organizations, as well as Asian organizations. And finally, I just want to make sure that city council members know that you know while you're working on budget FY 2022 budget uh, it's incredibly important to look at how RFPs are processed and making sure RFPs and contracting processes are conducive to the needs and the experiences of you know the the community-based organizations who are really doing the work and leading by example a lot of them are small a lot of them lack the capacity to really fill spend all the time on the, these RFPs not to mention language access issues and systemic issues so we would really want city council members to really look at these systemic issues and we look forward to working with them and, and remedying them because a lot of our organizations are doing the work they're doing it on a shoestring budget but they have demonstrated everything the city can do if we just work together so on uh, with that you know I want to thank you for the opportunity for giving us this, the opportunity to speak today. Um, you know, we've been through so much over the past year and especially over the past few months and the budget is the best way for city council to show that we're a priority and our community is cared for as it deserves. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Chair, I'll be calling on the next panelist. The next panelist will be Magdalena Barbosa followed by 
by Julie Tai. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Magdalena Barbosa. I'm a managing attorney at Catholic Migration Service in our employment law unit. And I'm submitting this testimony on behalf of the citywide immigrant legal empowerment collaborative SILIC in support of increased and sustainable multi-year funding for the low wage worker initiative. SILIC is a collaborative of several legal services organizations and community-based organizations that deliver high quality civil legal services and employment and immigration matters and provide community outreach and know your rights to low income and immigrant workers in the city. Um, for the past three years, the administration and city council have provided dedicated city funding to SILIC and other organizations that provide employment uh, related legal services through the low wage worker initiative to support the staffing and administrative structures needed um, to deliver these services to New York City's low wage workers. Um, the low wage worker initiative is the only dedicated city funding for employment related civil legal services to assist low wage and immigrant workers to obtain redress from wage theft, discrimination, and other workplace injustices. We strongly urge the New York City Council to demonstrate its commitment to New York City low wage and immigrant essential workers to stabilize this critical funding and baseline $7.5 million for the low wage worker initiative. In fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 20, the council budgeted um, the budget included $2 million for the Low Wage Worker Initiative and an additional $500,000 for the Low Wage Worker Support um, grant that provided outreach and organizing efforts to low wage workers. In fiscal year 21, the administration and council restored the $2 million for the Low Wage Worker Initiative after it was previously excluded from the budget, but unfortunately decreased funding for the Low Wage Worker Support. Without ongoing robust and sustainable funding, our organization's ability to continue to effectively address the employment related legal needs of the city are in jeopardy. Workers throughout the city's immigrant communities rely on programs funded by the low wage worker initiative as many cannot access or afford private legal representation. This grant allows organizations like Catholic Migration Services to represent workers who have been denied their earned wages and benefits by unscrupulous employers and government programs. When workers' wages are stolen or they are prevented from taking paid sick leave or lose their employment due to discrimination, their families struggle to afford basic necessities like putting food on the table and paying rent. Since January 2020 to date, our small organization, our small employment unit at Catholic Migration Services has recovered over $450,000 for low wage workers and recovered wages and settlements to resolve employment discrimination and retaliation. The need for funding of these programs that protect the economic security Time expired. Workers, oops, has increased since the outbreak of COVID-19. Our attorneys are responding to folks who have lost their jobs, fear for their health and safety on the job, or who have become sick or who have balanced the demands of working and caring for sick family members or children. Um, I'll speed it up. In, in light of the urgent need that I have described, I respectfully request that the New York City Council commit to baselining, baselining $7.5 million for the Low Wage Worker Initiative. Thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony and our organizations look forward to working with the City Council pr to protect the most vulnerable workers' rights during the pandemic and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for testifying. Thanks for your testimony. I appreciate it. And um, you know, it's really only the administration that can baseline any funds. The city council is only allowed to put in funding for one year. So um, we're all working on trying to get this administration to baseline the funding. Thank you so much. You. Next, we'll hear by Julie Tai, followed by Phoebe Flaherty. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. I'm obviously not Julie Tai, but I'm testifying in her uh, stead. My name is Carlos Castel Croak. I'm the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Um, NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I'd like to thank Chair Drum, Rosenthal, and all of the council members on the committee for the opportunity to testify today. NYLCV supports a fiscal year 2022 uh, city budget that secures progress on many of the environmental, transportation, and public health priorities Mayor de Blasio has committed to and when NYC and beyond. 
Our city is on the road to recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, and it is incumbent upon our elected leaders to invest their tax dollars in climate action and solutions as we rebound from this crisis and not lose ground, especially with the influx of relief funds that will flow from the American Rescue Act. We'd like to highlight three budget investments in fiscal year 2022 in order to fight climate change and protect public health, parks, organic waste management, and electric school buses. Parks and other green spaces are one of the city's most valuable environmental assets and are a major source of the city's urban canopy, which mitigates climate change and provides clean air and habitats for native wildlife and contributes to the well-being of our residents and economy. Preserving these spaces is a top priority for NYLCV. But over the past year, through the hardship of the pandemic, we have seen the cleanliness and safety of our parks drop significantly due to unfair budgetary cuts to staffing and programs, which will also uh, impact uh, the people who need it the most. Due specifically to the $45 million in cuts to seasonal staff spending and forestry contracts last year, parks saw one of the worst years for cleanliness on record. Therefore, in this critical year of our Playfair campaign, we're asking for the council to play for now and restore $78.9 million in fiscal year 2022 parks budget. Uh, last year, the city also made substantial cuts to the sanitation department. Um, we really need to reinvest in the sanitation department to make sure that we achieve our zero waste goals. Um, that will include uh, giving $40 million to the Department of Sanitation um, so it, they can fully fund the staff, consultants, and data management needed to implement commercial waste zones, along with $14 million in funding for pro composting programs across the city to start to bring us back towards our zero waste goals. Um, this funding will position us to take aggressive waste reduction actions, such as legislation to create a citywide curbside composting program. Um, an initiative such as this will ultimately save the city money, put organic materials back to use as fuels and soil amendments instead of treating, treated as waste, reduce emissions from landfills, and put us back on track with those goals. Um, and lastly, we also ask that the council invest $3 million um, in the fiscal 2020 budget um, for the purchase of electric school buses. Um, you know, we really need to make sure that we're protecting the people in our most vulnerable neighborhoods who really suffer from uh, asthma and other respiratory illnesses that are caused by time expired emissions. Um, real briefly, my last paragraph, um, the COVID-19 crisis is still placing stress on our economy and our communities. This is apparent in the FY21 budget that does not need to be the case again this year now that the federal government has provided relief. We urge the city council to have foresight and prepare for the next crisis that we are already amidst, the climate crisis. Combined, our asks are less than 0.1% of the total, total FY22 budget and will help us protect New Yorkers from climate change in 2021 and for years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Phoebe Flaherty, followed by David Reichstahl. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Phoebe Flaherty. I'm an organizer at Align. and We coordinate the Climate Works for All Coalition and the Transformed Trash Coalition. Um, and as we all know, we're still in the middle of this pandemic and New York's black and brown environmental justice communities are bearing the brunt of the impact of the virus and the economic downturn. We're seeing record high unemployment concentrated in BIPOC environmental justice communities. Our city's budget must prioritize investment and job creation for these communities that have been hit the hardest by the pandemic. As Climate Works for All, we've developed the Equitable Recovery Report, a roadmap to creating 100,000 good green jobs for New York City's black and brown communities and moving us out of the pandemic and recession towards climate goals by investing $16 billion over three years. This is the comprehensive plan that we need to move our city through crisis and towards equity and climate justice. We know that the city is still reeling from a crisis and we've developed interim climate budget priorities that will lead us on the same path towards uh, investment in communities and green job creation right now within this year's budget. So this year we're asking for, within the 2022 budget, an investment of 80 million to retrofit public schools and 100 million to install solar on public schools. As of 2019, uh, more than 1,000 K-12 schools um, are emitting at levels beyond local law 97's 2030 to 2034 period of compliance at an average rate of 775 per square foot to retrofit building. The city would need over a billion dollars throughout the next 13 years to meet the local law 97 emission targets, that is the city needs $80 million every year to retrofit schools. Research shows that these building retrofits would create uh, 482 good job, uh, union jobs at this level of investment annually um, throughout the crisis. In 2014, New York City committed to installing 100 megawatts of solar on public schools by 2025. In order to achieve this goal, solar panels would need to be installed in over 300 public buildings in the following decades. 
um, an immediate investment of 100 million towards DCAS solar program would provide the capacity and resources to meet the 2025 solar goals. Um, and at completion, the savings from these sites will be equivalent to taking more than 2,000 cars off the streets per year. And research shows that an investment of 100 million will create more than 500 direct and indirect jobs. Um, so in addition to these retrofit and solar asks, um, we're also asking to um, what we just heard previously, uh, investments otherwise, 17 million towards public waste management um, to expand uh, the composting and organics program, 4 million to staff the commercial waste zones program. Um, and we're asking for 3 million towards clean transportation expansions via electric school buses. So this total of 200 million um, an investment towards climate um, job creating policies for New York City is what we believe can move us out of the COVID crisis, address the climate crisis and move us uh, on the path towards an equitable recovery. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Next we'll hear from David Reistall followed by Deanira Del Rio. Time starts now. Hi. Uh, thank you to the committee and the committee chairs Rosenthal and Drum for having me. My name is David Rizdahl and in solidarity with Phoebe, I'm submitting this testimony on behalf of the Climate Justice Organization 350 NYC and their broader climate coalition Climate Works for All. This past year has illuminated and exasperated the trenchant inequalities in our system, but we at Climate Works for All see hope in the midst of all this turmoil. Our solution is to invest in green infrastructure projects that center black and brown communities, create good union jobs and move us towards our climate goals. We must address the economic recession, racial injustice and the climate crisis at the same time for these are, are all linked together. This is why Climate Works for All has put together an equitable recovery report, which is our broad vision for investing in communities and putting 100,000 New Yorkers back to work. But specifically for our budget priorities for 2021 are, as PP said, investing 80 million and retrofitting public schools to meet the local law 97 standards. Funding would go towards schools that are currently emitting above the 2030, 2034 standards. An annual investment of 80 million would bring a large portion of high emitting schools into compliance by 2035. We also, as PP said, uh, invest 100 million in solar in schools. Funding would go towards solar installation on public schools. An annual investment of 100 million would allow us to meet our solar goals by 2025. In addition, we are asking for 17 million for public waste management, including 4 million for CWZ implementation and 13 million to expand organics collection, plus an additional 3 million towards clean transportation expansion for electric school buses. Altogether, again, reiterating what Phoebe said, this is a total of 200 million in this year's budget for climate priorities. My wife uh, grew up in New York. My little brother suffers from acute asthma caused from the poor air he's breathed his entire life. We all deserve better. And the year of COVID has shown us how deeply our fates are linked. We must move into the future differently than we came. We must invest in our communities and address racial inequalities, create good union jobs and fight climate change. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Daniela Del Rio, followed by Isadora, Isoria Fields, excuse me. Time starts now. Great, um, good afternoon and thank you, Chairs Drum and Chair and Rosenthal and all the members of the committee and subcommittee. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm uh, here from New Economy Project, a citywide economic justice organization and testifying about the City Council's discretionary funding initiative launched in fiscal year 2020 that supports community land trusts citywide. Um, through the CLT initiative, um, New York City has gone from having one operating community land trust, one or two, to now more than 15 across the five boroughs of New York City, putting New York at the as a leader in the national field um, in terms of supporting community land trusts and community ownership over land housing and neighborhood development as a matter of racial justice, neighborhood equity, and just recovery. Um, our coalition, which uh, for this coming fiscal year 2022 will include 18 organizations citywide, um, is seeking $1.51 million in the city uh, discretionary funding budget 
to support this ongoing community education, organizing, neighborhood-led planning, and comprehensive training and technical assistance that has allowed the CLT movement to grow so robustly over the past few years. CLTs, um, again, are about promoting community ownership and stewardship of land, taking housing and development out of the speculative market, and ensuring that housing and other development on CLT land, which includes retail space, community-owned solar gardens, and much more, ensuring that all of that development remains permanently affordable and for community benefit. CLTs have, have been a very modest investment that the city council has made, but the returns have been multifold, um, preserving public subsidy in housing and other neighborhood-led development through permanent affordability and other restrictions. So we hope that the city council will continue its groundbreaking work to advance CLTs and social housing, particularly in the wake of the current pandemic, which has exacerbated housing and economic security. Um, and as the council starts to work um, on further policy making to, um, you know, to create mechanisms that channel land and housing, both in the private market and in the public land disposition realm, um, to CLTs and other community-based organizations. Um, in my written testimony, I will include um, the detailed one-pager that outlines the organizations involved and progress made. Many of those groups are also testifying here today, and you'll hear about the really deep, intensive work that is at the core of the community land trust model and just how far we've been able to get in less than a couple of years. Um, so thank you so much for your time today, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Del Rio. Always appreciate your advocacy and your smart testimony. Really appreciate your work. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Azoria Fields, followed by Hannah Nushe. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Committee Chair Cornegie, Subcommittee Chair Rosenthal, and members of the committee and subcommittee. I thank you all for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Isora Fields, and I am the president of the East New York Community Land Trust. As an organization, we're a grassroots organization that consists of members of the East New York community. It's truly an organization that is developed by the community to support community needs. Over the last year, we have done several events. We have hosted several events, both in person and virtually, to spread awareness about what a CLT is and how we can impact the community together. We have incorporated as a nonprofit organization and we have grown our steering committee to over 25 active members. And we have even went in the community and surveyed over 250 vacant publicly owned lots that are in East New York. These lots can be used for home ownership opportunities. They can be used for affordable spaces for businesses, commercial spaces. It could be used for green spaces. A lot of things that our community needs that we do not have currently. And this has been an exacerbated issue due to the COVID-19 pandemic. People are having a really hard time financially and as a realtor in the community, it pains me to have to tell people they cannot afford to purchase in what is one of the lowest income communities in our city. You know, it's, it's very painful to have to tell people that they cannot afford here. So instead of continuing that narrative, we need to change the narrative. By funding the CLT initiative and the initiative of CLTs across the city, we will provide that affordability that our community members really crucially need today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time and the perspective. Really appreciate that. Next, we'll hear from Hannah Nushe, followed by Deborah Ack. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Committee Chair Drum and Committee Chair Rosenthal and um, the other council members here today. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Hannah Anouche and I am the coordinator of the East New York Community Land Trust and I'm on staff at Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation. Um, East New York CLT is a member of the New York City 
uh, community land initiative nicely. And we are one of 18 existing or emerging CLTs in the growing citywide CLT movement. I'm here to urge this committee to advocate for 1.5 million in renewed funding for the citywide CLT initiative in FY22. Um, CLT, uh, CHLDC received funding for the CLT initiative in fiscal year 21. Um, and this allowed us to hire a CLT coordinator myself um, and work with community leaders to host CLT, CLT 101 workshops um, and educate the community about the CLT model. And these workshops led to the formation of the East New York uh, CLT and to our, the growth of our steering committee, which is made up entirely of East New York and Brownsville residents. And um, you know, these residents meet, meet weekly over Zoom and pour so many volunteer hours into this work. Um, and as Izora mentioned, we've surveyed hundreds of publicly and privately owned vacant lots across East New York. Um, and we're developing community plans for what residents would like to see on these sites. And we're really advocating for HPD, EDC, and other agencies to transfer ownership of specific sites to the East New York CLT for affordable housing and for other uses. Um, and we're really eager to take community control of land and actually put land in our CLT. But we really can't do this without renewed funding from the city council um, you know, as I mentioned, the CLT steering committee does an incredible amount of work um, and they're all volunteers, um, but it's a lot of work and we really need the city council funding um, for staff and for operational costs because it is really a lot of work and we really want the ability to grow the East New York CLT and the citywide CLT movement. Um, so again, I urge you to provide 1.5 million in funding for the CLT initiative in fiscal year 22. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Deborah Ack, followed by Athena Burkhoff. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Chair Drum in his absence. Good afternoon, Chair Rosenthal and members of the committee. My name is Deborah Eck and I am the recording secretary of the East New York Community Land Trust. The East New York Community Land Trust has given my life purpose, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. With being on lockdown, it gives me a reason to keep moving and fighting for a change in East New York. I have lived in East New York for approximately 18 years. I have raised two beautiful children here. I have seen the change in East New York and look forward to continuing change for my community. By acquiring long-term land ownership and stewardship for us by us, this funding will give us this opportunity to do just that. 2020 and 2021 has its ups and downs. It's all been hard for us both professionally and personally. For the East New York CLT, COVID gave us the opportunity to reach our community and surrounding communities via Zoom. Through our monthly one-on-one -on -one workshops, we have had individuals and nonprofit organizations reach out to us inquiring how they can create a CLT for their neighborhood. Just imagine a CLT in every corner of Brooklyn. This can only be done with the council's continued support. For the FY 2022 budget, we are asking for 1.51 million to move CLTs forward in New York. Through this pandemic, the East New York CLT has held 12 virtual community events and six in-person events to educate residents about the community land trust model and bring them into the CLT movement. We have deepened our community relationships through food giveaways, lot cleanups, and a youth design competition for a t-shirt. We need the city council to invest in our CLT and in the citywide CLT movement please renew funding for the CLT initiative at 1.5 million. 
thank you for the opportunity to address the council. Thank you so much, Ms. Ack, for coming. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Athena Burkhoff, followed by, we'll circle back to Kelly Grace Price. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, committee chairs Drum and Rosenthal and members of the committee and subcommittee, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Athena Bernkoff, and I'm the project coordinator of the East Harlem and Barrio Community Land Trust. We are also a member of the New York City Community Land Initiative and one of the 18 partner organizations that are part of the citywide Community Land Trust Initiative that seeks $1.51 million in city council discretionary funding to develop CLTs and permanently affordable housing, commercial and community spaces in all five boroughs of New York City. We are asking the committee and council to support renewed funding for the citywide initiative in the FY22 budget. The East Harlem Barrio CLT works to develop and preserve community controlled, truly and permanently affordable housing, commercial, green and cultural spaces in East Harlem and Barrio that prioritizes households of extremely low to low incomes. As a strategy to ensure permanent affordability, the East Harlem and Barrio Community Land Trust will own land and lease it to uh, buildings on that land as well as develop a resident controlled mutual housing association. As some already know, in the past year, we have closed on the first four properties to enter onto the CLT, including four residential buildings that will be owned by a newly formed East Harlem and Barrio Mutual Housing Association. In closing on this transfer, we've been able to begin on long needed repairs with a nonprofit development partner, Banana Kelly Improvement Corporation. These are repairs that some residents have been waiting on for over a decade and having been displaced from their homes, uh, their own homes over 12 years ago because the conditions of their buildings were unlivable. We have also been able to establish and protect the long-term stability of the property and rents in the buildings through the 99 year ground lease between the land trust and the mutual housing association. All of the residential units will be rented below market rate and arranged from 35 to 100% AMI. We continue to deepen resident engagement and process in trainings to prepare residents of the buildings to step into leadership of the Mutual Housing Association and the Land Trust. This has been made possible in large part through the funding we have received from the city so far, and we intend to continue expanding CLT infrastructure throughout Harlem and the rest of the city. We have turned to Community Land Trust as one of the most powerful tools we can use right now to invest in development without displacement. We uplift the leadership of black and brown working class communities in the stewardship of land and property, knowing that we are the most impacted by the city's housing and public health crises, and therefore we are best qualified to build out the foundations of healthy neighborhoods that actually meet our most critical community needs. Without this effort, we are likely looking at more short term actions that incur exorbitant costs to the city, which far outweigh any benefit that may come from them. We urge City Council to redouble its commitment to CLTs at this critical time. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and we look forward to continue working with you all and pushing forward a just recovery for New York City. Thank you, and really appreciate your work. We will now hear from Kelly Graves, followed by Michelle Cortese. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. I hope my audio connection has been fixed. I think it has from the subtitles. I'm Kelly Grace Price from Close Rosies. Uh, of course, we're dedicated to closing the Rose M. Singer Center, the female jail on Rikers Island. Uh, a, a few quick things from a budgetary uh, standpoint. Uh, we haven't seen any kind of bottom line uh, numbers for the women's jail. And maybe from a financial and budgetary perspective, Chair Rosenthal and Chair Drum, you might be able to get some sort of idea of gender parity in the DDC budget as far as jails. It would be wonderful to have any kind of transparency. The entire process, as you know, um, for the jails rebuild plan has been very oblique and not very cooperative. Uh, and maybe you can use your positions here to get some information out of the DDC about who the project manager is specifically can we have some clarity on timelines? Um, and also, can the design process be more collaborative? What we've seen is, is, is kind of a farce. Um, I heard the new commissioner say that um, ground has already been broken in Queens, but regardless if it's for the women's jail or the men's jail or a parking lot, no one's seen a plan. I haven't seen public plans of any kind. 
Uh, it would be nice if the DDC could have some answerability to the council on that. Um, that's all I have to say. Uh, I, I'm mad that I missed my um, opportunity to speak so early in this hearing. Thank you for giving me an early time slot. Uh, and thank you so much for always uh, taking our considerations into the budgetary process. Thank you so much, Kelly Grace Price. Really appreciate you. And, um, and you're absolutely right. You know, it's, it's crazy that they're not having the advocacy groups um, be more a part of designing um, what's going on in the new site. So thank you. Next, we'll hear from Michelle Cortese, followed by Marianne Cation. Time starts now. Can you hear me? I hope so. Um, thank you, um, Chairwoman Rosenthal, Chair Drum, I don't know if you're still on, and any of the other members of the City Council. Um, my name is Michelle Cortese. I am the Executive Director of the Center for Family Representation. I think um, we've met with you before, Chair Rosenthal. We work with 2,400 parents a year who are charged in family court by ACS when ACS alleges that they have maltreated their children or placed them at risk. Um, the vast majority of our clients are black and brown mothers and fathers who have been particularly impacted by the pandemic. They have lost access to part-time employment. They have had trouble accessing services. Many of them were unable to see their children for months at the beginning of the pandemic who were in foster care because visits were so abruptly halted. Um, I'm here to testify um, about three different things. Um, First and foremost, I would ask that City Council take whatever um, actions it can to pressure the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and OMB to restore um, our funding in FY22 to FY21 levels. All of the family defender organizations, CFR, Bronx Defenders, Neighborhood Defender Services of Harlem's, and Brooklyn Defender Services are still baselined at fiscal 2016 levels. And every year we go through a torturous and lengthy contract amendment process to enable us to get our funding restored where it needs to be. There is a huge backlog in family court. It has been largely virtual, which means there are many matters that the court has not attended to. And ACS filings are beginning to reach pre-pandemic levels. And as I'm sure you've heard and read about, there is a plethora of, of media attention about hidden child abuse, hidden child neglect. And as children's programming opens up, we're expecting many, many more filings. But our pending caseloads have remained exactly as they were pre-pandemic. So we are doing just as much work under very difficult circumstances for our clients. I'm also hoping that the city council and particularly the speaker will continue and increase funding for the right to family advocacy and guardianship initiative that enables the four uh, defender organizations to work with parents during an ACS investigation. We've continued to do this during the pandemic. We've had clients in shelters charged with neglect for not adequately helping their children attend remote schooling. We've had other parents charged with neglect for substandard housing, many, many things that they haven't been able to control during the pandemic or for their inability to access important services. Um, we are asking for $3 million in fiscal 22, um, and we are asking for the restoration of $9.6 million in um, the Article 10 funding contracts with MOCJ. The last thing I would just ask, because thanks to city council, we are able to give immigration assistance, housing assistance, and criminal defense services to our family court clients through the legal services for the working poor and the legal services for low income New Yorkers initiative. We hope that that funding will be robust again in fiscal 22, all of those issues for non-citizen clients, housing, public benefits, criminal defense, loom even larger as we come out of the pandemic. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. That's a lot of work. You need a lot more funding. <laughs> Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you. We will now hear from Marianne Cation, followed by Shane Correa. 
Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Ann Casey, and I'm Senior Policy Counsel with Brooklyn Defender Services. I want to thank the City Council and Chairs Rosenthal and Drom for holding this critical hearing on the city's budget. How we allocate our budget is a statement of our values. And this city must value the needs of its community members over government surveillance and control mechanisms that harm them. We at Brooklyn Defender Services provide critical services from criminal defense to family reunification, to immigration assistance, to support for our incarcerated neighbors that are all necessitated by major and unacceptable failures and gaps in our social safety nets. We are committed to providing a necessary bridge to quality services and relentless advocacy for people who continue to be impacted by the criminal legal, family regulation and immigration systems. But we are here to urge the city to move away from funding these systems altogether. Simply put, we urge the city and this council to take meaningful steps to make the need for our services obsolete. New York City is supposedly one of the most progressive cities in the world. Yet for too long, the city has invested in systems that have worked to surveil and control low-income neighborhoods and black and brown communities rather than investing in uplifting these communities and families. During the past few weeks of budget hearings, we've learned that the agency is committed to critical oversight, including the CCRB and the BOC, rely on private funding to do the work of holding the NYPD and the Department of Correction accountable for their treatment of New Yorkers. This does not jive with the stated goals of this city council. State institutions of surveillance and pacifications only grow while oversight entities struggle and largely fail to keep up. And we cannot continue to throw good money after bad. Specifically, it's time that this city valued the experiences and needs of its community members over a police force that neither protects nor serves them. While there has been considerable hand wringing over the message that defunding the police sends, we must consider the message it sends to our young people when we cut summer youth employment programs to afford to pay the officers who terrorize their communities, or when teachers are shortchanged while the NYPD blows past its annual overtime allotment, this time just eight months into the fiscal year. We must continue the, consider the message we send about the value of human life and dignity when we defund everything but the police. We urge the city council to work with the mayor to fund our communities and the programs and serv ser services that work for them, not against them. I thank you very much for your time and for your continued commitment to budget justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Love Brooklyn Defenders. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from Shane Correa, followed by Greg Mikalovich. Time starts now. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Rosenthal and members of the New York City Council for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Shane Karaya and I work at the Center for Court Innovation. I want to focus this testimony on the most time sensitive issues impacting our programming regarding reforms in the justice system, spanning cuts in funding to uh, justice programming during the pandemic to responsibly closing Rikers uh, and if time permitting gun violence in public housing. Uh, regarding the criminal justice uh, initiative uh, for innovative programming, during the fiscal year 21 budget, our sp uh, specific award was halved, which was unfortunate as its funding permits us to flexibly respond to the immediate needs of what we're seeing in our communities, pilot ideas, and evaluate them if they have any merit for taking it to scale. Uh, due to COVID, we focused on housing instability, mental health responses, and domestic violence program. But because of these cuts, we had to make difficult choices. Among them were reductions in support for anti-gun violence programming outside of catchment areas otherwise funded by the city, tra uh, child trauma support in the Bronx, and reduced DWI screenings and assessments for traffic safety while deaths this year reached some of the highest levels since the beginning of Vision Zero. We ask council to support a return to fiscal year 20 levels as the COVID situation stabilizes so that we can continue to pilot, evaluate, and implement models that we grow and leverage with public and private funding to help serve our communities. Next, on reducing the use of unnecessary incarceration, I would like to focus Council's attention on the points of agreement and specifically pre-arraignment diversion programming, which is included. Currently, City Council funds Project Reset, which helps divert people from their arraignment for uh, desk appearance tickets and prevents unnecessary bench warrants that can result in jail time. Uh, while funded in the outer boroughs through the administration, 
Funding was discontinued at the end of this past fiscal year and currently only operates in the Bronx and Manhattan through asset forfeiture funding. We would like to see project reset or pre-arraignment programming continue again in the outer boroughs. While it's included in the points of agreement, there is no specific date attached to it, which leaves a great amount of uncertainty on how to divert these cases from the justice system so that people don't unnecessarily end up in Rikers for a low-level DAT. Additionally, we'd also like to continue support from Council in our Brooklyn Felony Alternatives to Incarceration programming. We're seeing that we've been able to serve successfully over 73 people with an 89% compliance rate, keeping them in their community as opposed to on Rikers Island, and we were able to address issues such as substance use, mental health issues, and also, frankly, a proportion of them that are flagging for homelessness, which we know contributes to some of the instability that contributes to criminal behavior. I'm noticing the time now that I don't have uh, a moment to discuss gun violence and public safety, but I look forward to connecting with Council over the coming year on these issues. Thank you for the time. time expired. Thank you very much. May I ask, did you, um, were you, was your organization consulted as part of the police um, accountability overhaul? So uh, part of our organization, uh, specifically out in Brownsville and the Red Hook communities, did participate in certain forums with about 50 other uh, community-based organizations. Um, however, the extent and level of which is still something that I'm being briefed on um, and hope to connect with the NYPD and those teams over the next two weeks. Yeah. It might be worth looking at the sections that apply to the work you do and seeing if what's in there is sufficient. Absolutely. Yeah, really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Greg Mikalovich, followed by Robin Vitale. Time starts now. Okay, thank you, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Drum, members of the New York City Council. Uh, my name is Greg Mohanovich. I'm the Community Advocacy Director for the American Heart Association here in New York City. Uh, so at uh, AHA, we believe that every person deserves the opportunity for a full and healthy life. In order to accomplish that, we need to identify and remo uh, remove the social and systemic barriers to good health. And unfortunately, uh, COVID has only increased those barriers. Uh, but we do ask the New York City Council as we go through the budget process that, you know, with the federal aid coming from the American Rescue Plan Act, there's an opportunity to kind of accelerate the city's recovery from the pandemic. So on capital issues, I want to touch on uh, uh, active transportation and the written testimony goes into a little more more detail but physical act uh, uh, physical activity guidelines for Americans from the US Department of Health and Human Services recommends that adults should move more and sit less and engaging in daily physical activity reduces the, the risk of obesity heart disease stroke hypertension also helps you manage stress now promoting active transportation the opportunity to walk bike roll around the community through policy systems and environmental change is one of the leading evidence-based strategies to increase physical activity regardless of age, income, racial or ethnic background, ability or disability. I mean, to put it simply, the built environment contributes to an increase in physical activity. So there's a lot of great announced initiatives to help increase physical activity in New York City, permanent open streets, bikes on bridges, bike boulevards. They want to close gaps in Brooklyn and Queens greenways. And this is all great, but we need to make sure that there's de dedicated equitable long-term funding for these projects. And we ask the council and the different agencies to, to continue to look at this through an equity lens, uh, because there are a lot of under-resourced communities that don't have these act, uh, the access to these uh, the active transportation opportunities, because an investment in this uh, active living infrastructure is an investment in better health outcomes. Um, on a non-capital issue, I just want to touch on uh, AHA is really excited about this recent announcement of a $11 million investment in SNAP incentives. Um, the SNAP is uh, uh, really important in helping reduce food insecurity for households, but SNAP incentives helps people eat more fruit and vegetables, increase the quality of their diet, and a higher intake of fruit and vegetables uh, is actually associated with lower mortality rate. So. Um, you know, there to put it in perspective, though, this $11 million that is going to increase the program is a is a great step in the right direction. But $11 million is approximately $5 a month for 185,000 people. And there are nearly one there are more than $1.5 million, uh, 
5 million New Yorkers facing food insecurity. So this is just a small step in the right direction. It's not an opportunity to, uh, to, to do a victory lap. So we're reminding the council that the need is greater than this. We need to keep pushing the envelope to making sure that people have food on their tables and that they have healthy food on their tables so they can live their uh, full and healthy lives. So thank you for, uh, for your time. Uh, AHA remains your partner uh, in good health and thank you for everything you've done to protect uh, the health and well-being of uh, residents in New York City. Time expired. Thank you so much. Can I ask you two quick questions that are a little bit off topic? Are you familiar with Borough President um, Adams' um, sort of health plans for the borough and his school school lunch plans? Uh, we've we've uh, passively familiar. I wouldn't say that we're. I'm an expert on it, but <laughs> I'll answer what I can. Yeah, no, I just wondered if the American Heart Association would, would partner with him um, on some of the amazing uh, work he's done around um, diet oh. and, and food. Oh, and yeah, food. No, we, we have regular conversations with his office around it. You know, he, he's a big proponent of like the plant-based diet. And, and yeah, we've been talking not just beyond the city, but on a upper levels of advocacy about opportunities to, to work together. Um, but yeah, if, if there are specific questions uh, about it, but yeah, no, we, we have a good relationship with him and we, we talk awesome. about this stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah. I just noticed on your website that um, the most recent um, statements are, you know, that people should occasionally eat vegetables in a plant-based diet. And I, I, that just seemed curious to me, um, given all the concrete scientific evidence about a plant-based diet compared to a dairy and meat diet in terms of heart health. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, first and foremost, the AHA is a science, uh, a science bit backed organization. Like everything we we advocate for has a uh, the backing of you know, like peer reviewed science. And uh, but one of the things that uh, we have to acknowledge is meeting people where they are. So while eating more fruits and vegetables, or possibly even just solely, you know, fruit and vegetables in a plant based diet, maybe the thing that sometimes that's unattainable uh, for a lot of members. So the idea is like, how can you impact? Uh, better health outcomes in your diet in the short term. Um, you know, some of what like uh, uh, Burr President Adams is very aspirational, but in the short term, how can you improve in your diet? So it's it's a range uh, of issues. So I'd have to look specifically to what you were referring to on our website, but it's not just here's the gold standard. It's like, what can you do tomorrow? What, what kind of uh, small things can you move yourself in this journey to a, a better diet? Thank you very much. Yep. Next, we'll hear from Ram Vitale, followed by Ching Ching Fu. Time starts now. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal. And uh, I am Robin Vitale, serving as Vice President of Health for the American Heart Association, and happy to pick up the uh, mantle from where my colleague, Greg Mihalovich, left off. Um, most of our budget priorities do fall under the general expense uh, space, but I've been asked to prioritize two additional areas uh, beyond what Greg just shared. Um, I'll begin focusing on tobacco control. Um, specifically, there is a connection to the Department of Finance and the Sheriff's Office team specifically and their role in enforcing tobacco sales. Um, that, is, that is a tax issue. Uh, we are certainly very aware that anytime we pass any kind of tobacco control laws, there is an increase um, in, uh, in that need. And so we do uh, focus on that as an opportunity. Um, as you know, Chair, we continue to prioritize uh, our campaign to restrict access to mentholated products. Um, those tobacco products are particularly dangerous and continue to be um, uh, continue to victimize communities of color, low-income communities, um, and that is a top priority for our organization um, in the months ahead. Um, related to that, we are asking the council to invest in dedicated funds around tobacco cessation um, to make sure that as these laws are implemented, and um, we are supporting New Yorkers, particularly those communities, communities of color, low-income New Yorkers. Um, that are addicted to those products to make sure that they have access to the vital services um, to help them quit um, so they are not um, engaged in any type of enforcement activity. Um, secondly, I want to prioritize the Heart Association's uh, focus around hypertension, hypertension management. Um, this continues to be a significant area of concern um, with more than half of adult New Yorkers um, uh, I'm sorry, a third of our adult population um, 
sharing that they have been diagnosed with high blood pressure, and more than half of those um, are, have uncontrolled blood pressure. So significantly concerned for our mission um, as hypertension is a, a leading preventable cause of heart disease and stroke. Um, we are asking the council to uh, dedicate funds to um, our health systems, notably entities like h, &H as well as our related uh, health centers, um, who throughout the pandemic have continuously expressed need to provide more services, uh, more resources, so that New Yorkers can participate in telehealth services. Realizing that uh, through the pandemic, many New Yorkers were fearful of going to their doctor, fearful of going to uh, getting those routine checkups. We want to make sure that uh, as many um, health centers are equipped with things like blood pressure cuffs and related educational kits um, so that New Yorkers can stay at home, participate in telehealth appointments, and continue to monitor those numbers. Self-measured blood pressure is a evidence-based initiative. There's a tremendous amount of uh, support um, to having these resources available to the public, and um, we would love to see some dedicated funds from the, uh, the budget for that purpose. Um, I will stop there. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Sure, I appreciate it. But let me just continue for one second. Have you ever supported a plant-based diet? Has the American Health Heart Association ever pushed a plant-based diet for the Health and Hospitals Corporation or the Department of Education? You know, it's very interesting, Chair, and I really appreciate this line of, of conversation. Um, it is something that uh, we have, I think, discussed in the past, um, particularly with Borough President Adams and a number of, of others that are, are very uh, vocal and, and passionate about this. Um, as we have mentioned, you know, Greg did outline that the current positioning of the American Heart Association, um, while the evidence is growing in that plant-based space, um, our position nationally is to encourage individuals who are pursuing a, a strength and focus around their diet and nutrition to insert as many plants and, uh, and fruits and vegetables into their diet as they can, um, realizing that there are limitations in how affordable those items are, how accessible they are across the country. Um, we do want to be accessible and relatable to the majority of Americans. Um, that being said, I encourage you to continue this line of, of uh, thought um, I think the, uh, the, the future um, is very bright in that space, thinking about how the American Heart Association as a national organization can be more supportive and, and forward thinking um, down the road. Um, but at this time, the, the national position is to encourage New Yorkers to um, continue to uh, pursue fruits and vegetables as part of their diet, um, but not necessarily uh, restrict that, uh, that focus unilaterally to simply uh, plant-based diets. Okay. And can you remind me again, the American Heart Association, do you get funding from the agriculture, from the meat industry or the dairy industry? I'm happy to follow up with more specific details about that. You know, we are obviously certainly very focused on maintaining the ethics of our positions, keeping that uh, you know, completely separate from any positions that we do take. Um, we are very transparent in that. Um, to make sure that there is no conflict. Um, our, our policy positions, all of our work um, is independent from any funding that we receive. Hmm. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Next, we'll hear from Ting Ching Fu, followed by Bill Bateson. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Ting Ting Fu and I'm the lead organizer at UPROS. Thank you for the opportunity yes. to submit testimony today. I'm here on behalf of UPROS and the Climate Works for All Coalition to support the request and echo the urgency of adopting the Climate Works for All budget that prioritizes fair and necessary budget acts that moves us on a path towards an equitable future by creating climate jobs and justice for frontline black and brown communities like Sunset Park. Sunset Park is a frontline community of over 130,000 residents in Southwest Brooklyn that lives with many and polluting infrastructures and a growing number of climate change impacts, including more intense storms and increasing temperatures. Founded in 1966, Abril is, is Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. We are an intergenerational, multiracial, nationally recognized, woman of color-led, grassroots organization that works at the intersection of racial justice and climate change. This year we've seen investment in green, this year we must invest in green infrastructure projects in black and brown communities create good paying climate union jobs and moves us towards our climate goals while addressing climate, uh, economic disparities, racial injustice, and the climate crisis at the same time. 
An equitable recovery report is our broad vision for investing in communities and putting 100,000 workers, New Yorkers, back to work and moving us aggressively towards robust climate solutions. In Sunset Park, we have witnessed our community members lose their financial stability while experiencing the devastating impacts of COVID-19. As you know, communities of color like ours have felt the disproportional loss of jobs, health, and lives as a result of the pandemic. Sunset Park, like many other environmental justice communities across New York City, was the hardest hit by the global COVID-19 pandemic due to the long-term exposure to high levels of air pollution. Exposure coupled with socioeconomic disparities such as lack of access to health care, housing, and food security has caused extreme devastation in our communities. Media investments that support climate adaptation, mitigation, and res resiliency align with COVID recovery. Not only recovery from the pandemic itself, but recovery from an inequitable regulatory processes and systems that allowed the pandemic to have such dispor disproportionate impacts on frontline communities. As we build back, we must build back stronger. We must prioritize investments such as retrofitting of public buildings in our communities, boldly advancing solar initiatives in our schools, allocating funding for better waste management systems, and investing in expansion of electric buses particularly as a part of addressing the need for better surface transportation. These investments are key steps in both addressing the needs of, of communities struggling to come back from the many impacts of the pandemic, while at the same time working to address the impacts of climate change that are already here and those we know are on the horizon. A total of $200 million investment in this year's budget is a necessary start. We must invest in communities and address racial inequities, create good climate jobs, and fight climate change. Time I would like to thank I would like to thank the New York City Council for holding this hearing and mm -hmm. opportunity to provide this testimony. I made it. <laughs> awesome. Um, Ms. Fu, I'm a huge fan of Uprose. Uh, they just did wonderful community organizing um, around industry city and um, and your work with Align and the coalition is is much admired. So thank, thank you, you so for much. the testimony and thank you for participating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, we'll hear from Bill Bateson. Time starts now. I am Bill Bateson. I represent Ivica. I'm a working with partner with Friends of the East Coast of Esplanade in January of this year. Mr. Bateson. Uh, Mr. Bateson. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, am I hearable? No, that's the problem. It's going in and out, and it's... Oh. In January of this year, Mayor de Blasio announced a $284 million in funding for repairs to the East River Esplanade between Gracie Mansion and 125th Street at the RFK Bridge, which is East Harlem. Uh, Civitas and Friends of the Esplanade have co-sponsored a letter signed by 24 other groups, including of the State Assembly, and the leaders of both community boards eight and 11, thanking the mayor for his needed funding and requesting the money be included in the upcoming capital budgets and that the project be moved forward in the most expeditious manner possible. Um, the significant funding seems urgent and justified for the three main reasons. Um, erosion and structural uh, collapse that's manifest in recent years with sinkholes seems extremely likely to continue without structural remediation that prevents tidal action and water um, from seeping under the esplanade and removing the fill and rotting the piles. Um, um, this waterfront park is very thin, but important strip of recreational space between the FDR Drive and the Harlem River. Um, the FDR Drive is adjacent, and as the erosion continues, anyone who uses the FDR Drive should be concerned about this, this um, waterfront. Um, the second reason, uh, the Esplanade has astonishing potential as a waterfront destination for the adjacent neighborhood and also Upper East Hyde and Central Harlem. It contains a path that is a key link in the hoped for loop of the Manhattan Greenway. Um, and then finally, it is one of the very few good park spaces for East Harlem. Um, the city has dedicated substantial funding for multiple locations on the east uh, river waterfront further south around the Battery and 59th Street Bridge, including engineering an entirely new, beautiful um, waterfront near East Midtown. Um, 
the East Harlem waterfront is actually collapsing and being eroded away. And um, we feel the disparity is um, disturbing and this should have been a higher priority um, a long time ago. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and we'll call you in the order in which your hand is raised. Chair Rosenthal, seeing no hands raised currently in Zoom, it appears that we've concluded our public portion of this hearing. Well, I um, want to make sure I'm unmuted. Um, I just want to thank everyone who testified today. Um, as council has said, as a reminder, if there's anyone who would like to submit written testimony for the record, they may do so by emailing their testimony by next Monday to testimony at council.nyc.gov. And uh, with that, this concludes today's hearing.